The first post for this entry was made about 8 months ago in r slash legal advice. It's titled, My husband is missing. I think his parents are involved. My husband was away for work last week and was supposed to come home Saturday. He was not responsive until I texted his mother to ask if she'd heard from him. He then answered his phone immediately after 3pm to tell me, I love you, I'm not coming back, I need to do some soul searching, I'll talk to you later this week. He was on the speakerphone and sounded very strange, like I imagine a hostage would sound. We have no problems in our marriage, I was completely blindsided. My husband has depression, paranoia, and undiagnosed autism. His father is a silver-tongued narcissist who has always manipulated and abused him. His parents have always hated me and tried to get rid of me, going so far as bribe a therapist to tell him to leave me. They tried to verbally force him to leave me and even went so far as to convince my husband that the police were going to kill him if he stayed in our state. His father is a powerful figure in their home state, let's say state B. While we live in state A, I went to my husband's work Monday after a co-worker told me he was there. But then I received cryptic text messages from his phone telling me to leave and he'll contact me later. I am beginning to suspect he is not in possession of his cell phone at all and am terrified his parents had him committed without his consent or pressed a false legal charge against him. I haven't heard anything since. I'm filing a missing persons report here in state A today. I've called both his phone and his mother's who has been refusing all contact with me that I'll be doing so, but aside from that, I have no idea what to do. OP would go ahead and update their post three times. Edit number one said, went to the police. They called his parents who were evasive and said he's fine and they're in contact with him but were behaving very strangely. They also continue to ignore any attempt of mine to contact them. The police said there's nothing they can do. Edit number two said, the sheriff called me and met me at the house to hand me signed divorce papers. I have no idea what happened. He never contacted me. Thanks for the help Reddit, but I guess that's that. Edit number three said, an affair. He was having an affair. And being the trusting little autist that I am, I never suspected a thing. I'm sure his parents were aware as well. OP later would take to the r slash divorce subreddit saying, I thought my marriage was fantastic. I'd never been happier in my life. We just bought a house and were picking out paint colors. And then the day he was supposed to come back from a work trip, he just said, I'm not coming back. Two days later, he filed for divorce after refusing all contact with me except when I went to his office to try and talk to him, and he told me more or less to piss off. He hasn't contacted me since. I've come to realize that all the signs of an affair were present and I just didn't see them. I loved him more than anything and I would have done anything to save our marriage, but he didn't even bother. I found out that he had filed from an officer who came to the house. Seven years together since I was 19. We had just celebrated our second wedding anniversary and he just threw me away like trash. My family and friends are amazing and are doing everything they can, but none of them can really understand the hell I'm going through. I can see all the problems we had now that I had been blind to, but knowing why it failed doesn't help the agonizing game hole in my chest. I didn't know it was possible to hurt this badly. I just want to be loved, but I feel like that's never going to happen again. I'm scared to go on. I'm afraid no one is going to want to be with me as a transgender man and one that's been divorced. All the while, the loneliness is crushing me. I miss my husband. I miss my best friend. I miss the man that loved me. This entry is a now deleted reddit post titled, What Could Have Been The Reason Why Someone Operated On My Dog, and it was posted to Reddit Bureau of Investigation. It said this, I originally posted this to another sub which is now deleted and was insisted that I repost this here instead. I live alone in a suburban area and when I go out, whether it's for work, social gatherings, shopping or whatever, I leave my Labrador dog to play in my backyard with plenty of food and water. He is a pretty healthy dog and had nothing wrong with him. I would say I live in a pretty safe neighborhood and never had anything bad happen to my dog while I was away. Yesterday, I came back home from work in shock to see that my dog had been stitched up. In shock, I immediately rushed to him, called, and took him to his regular vet. 
Strangely, the doctor who was inspecting him said that whoever was operating on him actually did a pretty good job, and for whatever reason, took out part of his fat. The wounds are on both his lower and upper belly area. Luckily, he isn't in any danger, but the doctor said he would be in some pain for a week, which is normal for these kinds of wounds. I was given painkillers and antibiotics for my dog. I was also given a cone for him to wear so he wouldn't lick his wounds. Naturally, I asked him if a Labrador came into the vet today, as in yesterday, and he and the receptionist said no, and they said to their memory it's the first time they saw my dog that day. So this got me and the doctor thinking. Either someone operated on him or someone took him to another vet and got him operated for whatever reason. In the meantime, I have reported this to the police and have called other vets around my town and no luck as of yet. Due to this, I am still unsure what could have caused this. Who and why would someone take out parts of fat out of my dog? I don't have any enemies, nor do any past relationship partners come to mind who may do this. I've also spoken to some neighbors and they said that they didn't notice anything strange around the neighborhood or near my house. I also don't have any cameras. So the dog is all good, but just who was responsible for caring for the dog, and just how exactly did they get to it? OP did say that they kept the dog in the backyard when they went out, but then why was someone in their backyard in the first place? I personally find that extremely creepy, just having someone invade your property like that when you're away. A number of users came forward and proposed some possible explanations, but to be completely honest, none of them really make sense or seem viable. Additionally, the surgery just seemed essentially meaningless. No major organs were removed, just a bit of fat. But it seems like the most likely explanation takes place within the backyard. There were a number of people who suspected that the dog may have gotten out, but again, none of the neighbors reported seeing the dog on the road. One neighbor even had cameras that watched over the entire road, and after investigators took a look at the footage, they found no sign of the dog. Another popular theory was that the dog got into a fight with another dog or animal, but this doesn't seem likely as there were no signs of any other injuries with the dog. There was only the wound from the operation, so this does not seem likely either. This post refers to a creepy looking glitched Amazon Prime screen that one user experienced on their PS4. According to OP, the glitch occurred during a loading screen which jumbled up the majority of the text, leaving only a few lines legible. And the combination that does remain is kind of eerie. We can see phrases like, she can't breathe, won't let you do whatever, anything in your life, and as you can see there are a number of colored blocks which I assume are part of images. One user thinks that they see faces within the blocks which I think I can see as well, but barely. According to OP, they were watching House and they believed the words to be subtitles. Now this is probably a pointless post to include, but there are some people that suggest that this was something more than just a random glitch, possibly an ARG, government experiment, or something along those lines. But personally, I don't think it's any of that. This post was made on the Ask Me Anything subreddit by user Incredibly Shiny Shart. The title said, Hi all, I am a man who ate a portion of his own amputated leg. Ask me anything. About two years ago, I was hit on my motorcycle. They salvaged my foot, but I would never be able to walk on it. I elected to have it amputated. I asked the doctors to keep it. I signed some papers. I got it back and with the help of some friends, cooked a portion of the tibialis anterior. Edit, I taste like buffalo but chewier, super beefy and little fat. OP did attach a couple of photos of the meal that he cooked up, but it just looks like beef. On the off chance that this is real, I'm not going to show it, but it's easily accessible online. One of the other photos is of his stump, which at first didn't look quite right to me. I thought that the top of this picture was actually his knee and that his leg was bent in such a way to hide everything under the knee, but on the right side, you can see what appears to be his kneecap, so maybe the guy is legitimately missing a foot slash leg but the rest of the story could very well just be made up. Let me know what you think in the comments. This post was made on r slash off my chest over a decade ago. It's titled, My mother has poisoned me. 
This is a throwaway account. Ever since I became an adult about a decade ago, my mother has been against me moving out of the house. I finally got a job as a line cook three years ago. My mother and the rest of my family, which includes my sister and father, has been against it, mainly saying that such a job cannot sustain me, which was true. They also said that I would hate working, which turned out to be false. About a year and a half later, I quit due to health reasons. The following spring, I got a new job as a computer programmer. While while they seemed supportive at first, my mother and sister, who I lived with, gradually became hostile. Eventually, I moved out of the house. About a month later, I lost my job and about three months later, moved back home. Everything was cool at first, but as I was getting calls from recruiters and going to job interviews, they gradually became more hostile again, accusing me of being distant and not caring for them. However, they seemed to be very controlling and hateful of the fact that I wanted to move out and wanted a decent job. So last month, I finally got that job as a programmer again, but it was out of town. I had just enough money to relocate to the new city. They became very hostile starting a few days before I left, accusing me of not loving them, of hating them. On the day before I was scheduled to leave, my mother gave me two of the styrofoam ramen noodles cups, but that cardboard covering that normally comes with it was torn off and thrown away. I was suspicious that they would try to sabotage my life, so I was careful in not trying to anger them. She gave a few more food items, which I didn't use, to take on the trip with me. When I arrived at my new city and entered my hotel room, I chilled out. I was to go to work the next day. So after the first day at work, I ate a cup of ramen noodles and fell ill. I knew that feeling because my sister fed me something that made me feel the same way in late 2011, which I then assumed was because of my recent illness. I felt weak, lightheaded, and short of breath. I drank water to make me feel better, because that's what I did last time that happened to me. Over the week, my mother kept calling me, making sure to remind me to eat my ramen noodles. I was short on cash then, waiting for my first paycheck. I never told her that I ate it. I suspected then that I had been poisoned, and after doing some googling, believed it was cyanide. Now, that is something that you should never have to think that your own mother would do to you. So, I resisted that thought because I simply could not bear to think that. So I went to cyanidetest.com and ordered a kit and I tried it. Now look at the graphics and the video on this page. Now here are my results of my test. I guess I am going to have to call the cops and I will never speak to my family again. Edit. Thank you for being my support group. You will get updates on this story. Update. 8.45am. I am currently in Topeka, Kansas. I work downtown in a government office building, which has a police department. I visited the Capitol Police Station here and spoke to an officer. I showed him the evidence and he said that he could do nothing about it since the package was opened and might have been contaminated. So does anyone have any ideas? This post is about a man who suffered a head injury then seemed to have had a decade of his future flash right in front of his eyes in a matter of seconds. When he awakes, he notices something odd with a particular lamp. My last semester at a certain college, I was assaulted by a football player for walking where he was trying to drive. He was 325 pounds while I was 120. While unconscious on the ground, I lived a different life. I met a wonderful young lady. She made my heart skip and my face red. I pursued her for months and dispatched a few jerk boyfriends before I finally won her over. After two years, we got married and almost immediately she bore me a daughter. I had a great job and my wife didn't have to work outside of the house. When my daughter was two, my wife bore me a son. My son was the joy of my life. I would walk into his room every morning before I left for work and doted on him and my daughter. One day, while sitting on the couch, I noticed that the perspective of the lamp was odd, like inverted. It was still in 3D, but just wrong. It was a square lamp base, red with gold trim on four legs and a white square shade. I was transfixed. I couldn't look away from it. I stayed up all night staring at it. The next morning, I didn't go to work. Something was just not right about that lamp. I stopped eating. I left the couch only to use the bathroom at first. Soon, I stopped that too as I wasn't eating or drinking. I stared at the effing lamp for three days before my wife got really worried. She had someone come and try to talk to me. 
By this time, my cognizance was breaking up and my wife was freaking out. She took the kids to her mother's house just before I had my epiphany. The lamp is not real. The house is not real. My wife, my kids, none of that is real. The last 10 years of my life are not effing real. That lamp started to grow wider and deeper and it was still inverted dimensions. It took up my entire perspective and all I could see was red. I heard voices, screams, all kinds of weird noises and I became aware of pain. A effing ton of pain. The first words I said were, I'm missing teeth and opened my eyes. I was laying on my back on the sidewalk surrounded by people that I didn't know. Lots were freaking out. I was completely confused. At some point, a cop scooped me up, moved me across the sidewalk and grass, and threw me face down in the back of a cop car. I was still confused. I was taken to the hospital and given CT scans and stuff. I went through about three years of horrid depression. I was grieving the loss of my wife and children and dealing with the knowledge that they never existed. I was scared that I was going insane as I would cry myself to sleep hoping I would see her in my dreams. I never have, but sometimes I see my son, usually just a glimpse out of peripheral vision. He is perpetually 5 years old and I can never hear what he says. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM, which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Farts. It also supports the channel, so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now back to the video. r slash discontinence is a strange subreddit to say the least. The description reads, for higher knowledge and unheard subject, worlds found. This is a place where one can share their world or worlds as subjects unheard of elsewhere where they aren't related in topic. It is recommended to switch to new posts on viewing popularity is misleading as top discovery. The community was created by user Sam of Eclia and the vast majority of the posts made in the subreddits are by the same person. His account was later banned. One of his posts said, Before I smoked my stuff mixed with salt, bong water, and sugar, I tried just heating it with a torch. My stuff in disapproval decided to break my thick glass cup on its own as it burnt up. But after I explained it to them, they understood and did not break my pipe, because they knew I did love them. I told them that they had to find a way to get back into my body from there because life is really hard and it can get you like that, so you better be ready to survive it. Plus, I damn well bet when the remains of the stuff get back into my body, the other stuff will hopefully start to get suspicious enough to prepare just in case. If not, they might not even make it. Cause what if I did it that day? They have to get back in or they're screwed, aren't they? So this teaches my stuff that life is hard and to adapt to survive it starting then so they'll be ready for the years after now that are even more risky and dangerous than today. So yeah, the guy is a bit unhinged. Most of his posts are like this, which eventually attracted an audience who wanted to see what the guy was up to. Some users were even more concerned for the guy and asked if he was okay. Sam made the following response. Nah, I'm fine. I just feel like they're starving the poor cause they didn't have the free meal palace open for them today in my city. So now the government is risking its own demise at the fate of what it did to itself, for not respecting the way that lets it live. It's cause they're just not letting people eat anymore. It's cause they're not doing their job anymore. They're trying to steal it from others and so they're gonna be left to not owning any of it anymore. If they just keep trying to starve the poor to have more money for themselves, because there's a limit to how much you can manage to take from people before they snap. The subreddit is now banned, but there is an archived version of the subreddit. If you scroll through it, you would see Sam responds to seemingly simple questions with extremely sophisticated answers that are completely irrelevant to the question. This entry was made on the r slash confession subreddit by user throwawaybaloney8000. It's titled, I lured a homeless woman to my house hoping to F her. I, male, 43 years old, did this almost 10 years ago and it's something I've never told anyone before. 
It was hugely reckless, manipulative, and occurred during a time of rampant self-destruction and reckless behavior for me following a nasty divorce. I was living alone and very lonely, not finding any luck in regular dating or even one night stands. I started using Craigslist and Backpages to find hookups. I connected with a woman, Michelle, who was in a nearby city and claimed to be homeless and looking for help. I'd seen tons of scams like this and fallen for a few where a personals ad was really just step one of a larger scheme to get some fast cash. I decided to play along a little and we chatted for a day or so. We were connecting and I began to think she was telling the truth. Or at the very least, a very consistent storyteller. We exchanged pics and she was reasonably okay looking, older than me by about 7 years, but not some bag lady type person. Honestly, not someone I would have otherwise pursued, but for the fact that I thought if I gave her a place to sleep, she'd be grateful. So we made arrangements for me to come meet her downtown one evening and we had coffee in a diner. She was actually sort of kind of cute in person. She was really short, but very loud, intelligent. She was crafty and showed me pictures of a bunch of stuff she'd made by hand, like knitting and dollhouse furniture. She loved sending physical letters and cards in the mail. She loved handwriting and calligraphy and and said letters felt more personal than texting or emails. But she was also definitely a bit weird. I remember she had some really strong opinions about mundane food choices and went off on some bizarre conspiracy theory tangents with next to no prompting. I chalked it up to her living on the streets and thought I could probably manage a little weird if it meant I could get what I wanted. I decided to roll the dice because above all other things, I was incredibly desperate. I invited her back to my apartment, saying that she could stay with me a few days if she wanted. She didn't hesitate even a second. She only had two small bags with her, so we grabbed those and took off back to my apartment. To be absolutely clear again, I was not doing this to be a good guy or because I cared about her. At no point did I ever genuinely want to help this woman or improve her life. This was 100% in the hopes of getting her comfortable enough at my place that we'd hook up. Every dollar I spent in gas or coffee was mentally calculated as a cost of getting to that point. Every kindness and word I said that first night was part of a larger design. At the time, I think I was even trying to fool myself into thinking I was being a nice guy, but now, years later, I can see how manipulative it all was. I never intended to physically force her to do anything she didn't want to, but I was most definitely trying to build a path towards us having and I was definitely abusing a power dynamic by trying to create a situation where she was 1 at my place with no convenient means to leave on her own and 2 felt obligated to repay my generosity. So we get back to my apartment and I let her shower, get cleaned up, have a late night snack. We watch some TV and cuddle up on the couch, and she's just incredibly grateful and also very clingy. She would sit really close and at one point asked if we could hold hands. Later, she broke down a little and cried because she said she'd not felt safe in probably 8 months or so. She had been either staying on the streets, in shelters, cars, or with someone who was dangerous because she had no other options. She thanked me repeatedly for being kind and giving her a chance. Each time I told her it was no problem, I was happy to do it, I was so glad I could help, etc. But none of that was true. I was still just waiting for the right time to see if I could pivot into something physical. She asked how long she could stay. We'd already discussed this before I agreed to let her come over and I told her just 3 days. I had partial custody of my kids at this time and could not let her be there while the kids were with me. She seemed to swing wildly back and forth between sadness, gratitude, and not knowing what to do next. I couldn't be sure I would succeed if I made a move, so I left it alone. As the night wore on, I told her I needed to get to bed because I had to work tomorrow, and she said okay, but just sort of sat and waited for me to do or say something else. I walked her back to my kids room and told her she could sleep in there. There was a bunk bed and lots of clean linens and stuff in there, and I said I would be right down the hall if she needed anything in the night. I could tell she was really surprised. I started to realize that I was not being smooth or clever and that she 100% expected and anticipated me wanting her to come to my bed. And I know now I am not the first or last guy to abuse her in this way and I think vulnerable people just sort of get used to being taken advantage of. 
I wanted it to be her choice and didn't want to tell her or even suggest to her to come to my room. In my messed up head, I thought that still made me somewhat honorable, so I left her there and she slept in my kid's bedroom all night and I slept in mine. I waited up about 45 minutes, hoping she'd come down the hall. At one point, I heard her get up and use the hall toilet and I got excited thinking this is it. But then she went back to the other room. We woke up the next morning and she was so happy. She said it was the best night's sleep she'd had in a very long time. We had a quick breakfast and coffee that morning before I left for work and she asked if I could give her some cash for the day. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. She claimed she wanted to walk to the nearest store and get some cleaning supplies and clean my apartment as a thank you for letting her stay. I told her she didn't need to do that or repay me at all but she really wanted to. So I gave her $50 and left her there in the apartment for the day. In hindsight, it was an insanely stupid thing to do. I could have been completely cleaned out and robbed by the time I came home. She could have invited other people over, gotten high, or trashed the place. We texted a little during the day, but I never knew for sure what I was going to come back to, so I was getting increasingly anxious. And up to the point that I actually walked in, I was still half expecting her to be gone, along with my TV and anything else of value. But no, she was there and had done exactly what she'd said. She'd walked into Walmart and gotten a bunch of stuff, cleaners and a new mop, and had cleaned my whole kitchen and both bathrooms, vacuumed and everything. When I got home, she ran up to me and hugged me, and it was like we'd been living together for a long time. She showed me everything she cleaned and playfully reprimanded me for not having better supplies. She asked about my day and how I was doing and we just had a great rhythm and a lovely evening. I remember she asked the cook and I said sure, but because I was an idiot single guy at the time, I didn't have much. She made some kind of chicken something dish from what she could find and it was honestly pretty terrible. But I smiled and thanked her and told her it was great because it was a sweet gesture and also because everything seemed to be coming together. We cuddled again that night watching a movie and this time she started to get pretty bold. She would hug me and run her hands under my shirt, put her fingers through my hair, lay her head on my shoulder, and touch my legs a lot. I just let her do whatever she wanted. I gave her very little back. I wanted to do more, but as soon as my plan started to obviously work, I began to feel incredibly guilty and like a complete piece of crap for everything I'd done up to that point. The night went on and it was getting late. I told her again I needed to get to bed because of work in the morning. As we walked down the hall, I started to tell her good night at the other room and she just asked, can I sleep in your bed instead? And I said, I don't want you to feel like you have to do that. Absolute lie. I orchestrated this moment to make her feel that way and definitely wanted her in there. She said, no, I want to. This bed is nice, but I want to be next to you if that's okay. So we both went to my room. Now, I don't know if she had decided to come in during the day besides to clean the adjoining bathroom or if she would have respected my privacy, but she at least acted surprised because my bed's way nicer than the kids' bunk beds, obviously. She kind of hopped and bounced a little, laughing like a kid, and she looked so happy to be there. I stripped down too, and really enjoyed just getting to see her whole body at last. As soon as the lights went down, she got really aggressive right away. I do remember though, she was a terrible kisser. She did this thing where she would kind of open and close her mouth while she kissed like she was chomping. But this was what I'd been planning for, and so we went for it. The next day, it was like something had completely lifted for me. Call it clarity, I guess, but I had gotten what I wanted out of this exchange so I was ready to move on and I started to think more and more about how dangerous and reckless I'd been in this whole scenario. That next morning she was sort of idly talking about the weekend coming up. I reminded her that I had told her she could only be here for three days. I could tell she was hoping that the previous night might have changed things, but I held firm. I began to immediately pull away emotionally because I didn't want to be manipulated into changing my mind. I got a bit colder to her and left for work again that morning. The whole way there, I was cursing my stupidity at being so cold. Not because I'd obviously hurt her feelings, but because now she might want to punish me, and I just left her alone again at my place. 
I got back home that evening and everything was fine. She had gone back to the store and gotten some more food and had a nicer dinner waiting for me. I tried to be so nice but was in such a crappy mood on the inside. I think because she was doing everything she could think of to show me how nice it was for her to be there to be grateful and all I could do was to see it through the same lens I'd use on her. That she was now manipulating me and trying to get me to fall for her so that I'd let her stay. I tried not to let it show but I think she could definitely pick up on the change in the atmosphere. I said a few times that night about how I'd need to drop her off at some point the next day before my kids came over, either before work or right after I got back, making it clear the plan wasn't going to change. By the end of the evening, she'd made arrangements for a friend to come and pick her up. I told her, you can't let them in here, you know that right? And I could tell it really hurt her feelings. She said she understood. When it was time for bed, the mood lifted a little, and we both got playful with each other again. We both slept in my room again that night, and despite how I'd acted, she was still all over me once the lights went off. I remember thinking in the dark while her head was on my chest and I was playing with her hair. I imagined what my life might be like if I decided to treat this woman like an actual person and not just use and discard her. But then I tried to imagine how I'd explain her to other people or what my friends would think of her. Someday, it might come out what I've done, and someone else would see through my BS and realize I had manipulated her. So I started to focus on everything she'd done that I didn't like, like the bad food and the terrible kissing, the weird conspiracy stuff, and I just closed my mind to anything else. I'd done something reckless but made it out with my kidneys intact and shouldn't try to push my luck any further. The next morning, I was feeling terrible but wouldn't budge on her having to leave. I never even asked her where she would actually go or who the friend was that was picking her up. All that mattered was that she was gone by the time I came back from work. She asked to keep in touch and for a way to send me a letter, so I gave her my P.O. box. She texted me during the day to tell me she got off safely, and sure enough, she was gone by the time I got home. She left the place in great condition and even made the beds. I remember because my kids were like, Dad, why did you do that? Because I have never once made theirs for them. We chatted via text for a little while longer. I want to say maybe a few weeks at most. Just very superficial, hey how are you, hope things are good type texts. She had gone back to the city where there were more resources for her and had hopes for a job lead. I just gradually stopped replying much and then at some point she never texted again. I'm telling the story now in all its detail because I was and am a complete piece of crap. I took advantage of this vulnerable woman for my gain. I didn't actually care about her or her situation or what happened to her when I was done. I didn't rape her by the technical definition, but I definitely coerced her and manipulated her. I tried to justify it in my head by saying that these were her own choices, but I told her lies that I thought she'd want to hear, and I intentionally created a situation where she would have those choices to make. So now I can say unequivocally I did something truly awful to this poor woman. It's something I will hide for the rest of my life out of shame and guilt because I know it was terrible and it makes me question the kind of person I truly am at my core for having done it. The account is named as a throwaway but it seems that the user is still active on it with the last comment being made about a week before this recording. If you take a look through OP's account history, you'll find comments revolving around manipulation as well as relationships in general. And the comments to OP's post are a bit worrisome to say the least, but then again, it's Reddit. I'm not sure what I was expecting in the first place. For example, one comment says, I found this story strangely moving. I don't think you should be hard on yourself. Everyone at some point has conspired to do something nefarious in their lives at some point. I think you actually showed the lady that not everyone, especially men, maybe are not all bad. There are surprisingly a lot of comments similar to this. And to that other comment, it's not like he was intentionally trying to show that men were not as bad. If she knew his true intentions, she would likely also become one of those people that just constantly rant, all men are the same. But anyway, this topic is pretty sensitive, so let me know what you think in the comments. This post was made back on June 3rd, 2020 and involves a pretty disturbing looking image. What exactly is happening in the photo is a mystery. Any idea what's happening in this photo? Someone in a mom's group I am in on Facebook said someone she knows found this in a book bought at Goodwill. She claims to have given it to police. My first thought was it's prob from a movie but can't find anything on Tinai. 
Thoughts? Looks like a guy face down in water on the left with his feet bound and on the right, a guy with knees up tied to his body. Also, shadows look like a guy holding a gun. Various Reddit users have tried to enhance the image to get a better look, and I'm gonna be honest, I had a very tough time discerning details in this image at first. There's the obvious person on the right in a red shirt with his hands tied behind him, and then in front of him is a person who seems to be lying on their stomach. You can see their hands tied behind their back as well as their feet. There's also a shadow on the land that looks like it belongs to a person. It seems that the shadow is making its way to what seems to be a car door, which can be seen by the shadow in front of it. Most wanted to believe that the photo was a hoax or part of some movie, but later it was suggested that the person shown in the photo was a missing person, specifically Teddy Franks, who has now been missing for over three decades. Teddy disappeared on Labor Day weekend 1986. According to his sister Michelle, Teddy and his wife engaged in a heated argument which led to Teddy taking off. From there, he went to his other sister's home, Renee, who then drove Teddy to a business on Jackson Lane in Middletown, Ohio. But right as the two were nearing the business, Teddy began to panic at the sight of another person. He jumped out of the vehicle and ran to the back of the Sitgo gas station. This would mark the final time he was seen. Most of his friends and family are of the belief that he is no longer alive, and they received little updates in regards to Teddy until that photo we just went over made its rounds across the internet. When Teddy's sisters were shown the image, they weren't certain whether the man was Teddy or not. Another theory suggests that the man pictured is Christopher Lorette, who is another missing person who disappeared in August of 1977. Due to the poor quality of the original image, it's extremely difficult to identify the man in it. One Reddit user proposed the idea that the image was from the movie Deliverance. However, the film does not have a scene with this photo, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't related to the film, as the scene in the photo may have been cut in the final rendition. Another user attempted to find out what kind of book the image was found in and it was later revealed that it was housed in a scrapbook and it was the only image remaining inside. Many people wanted the photo to be scanned in order to find developer marks to possibly locate where it was printed and by whom, but it seems that this was never done. Furthermore, there was a comment made by OP where it seemed that the origin of the book was from Washington State, making it very likely that the photo was also taken in the same place. However, the original comment seems to have been deleted, but if true, Washington does have one of, if not the highest rate of serial killings, which makes the image all the more eerie. Okay, so this entry was straight up disgusting, and after reading it, I was thinking about not including it, but hey, I'm sure some of you guys will get some form of entertainment out of this. And at first, I thought that perhaps this was fake, but the story is so absurd, it's probably real. The post was created by user MK underscore Martian. It's titled, I used to search the garbage in my friend's house for tampons to smell. This is kind of embarrassing, and I don't know how I got the idea to do it. It all started when I was 16. I was at my aunt's house. I was taking a dump and when I wiped and opened the garbage to throw the paper, I saw the tampon sitting there inside waiting for me. I couldn't help myself but to grab it and smell it. This became a habit over time. Every time I would go to someone's house, the first thing I would do is search the garbage. Became an addiction. Thank god though I'm 18 now and this addiction is long gone and hopefully something no one else does. LMAO. Yeah, a wild story. Bojo here took the words right out of my mouth. It's okay to not post some things. Another user said, it would have cost you zero dollars not to post this. You have dishonored your ancestors on this day. There probably is a high likelihood that this story is fake, but again, it's just so wild, like why would anyone even lie about this in the first place? This entry was made in r slash rbi by user prolapse this. It was titled, Police Didn't Investigate and It's Bothering Me. At around 8.30pm, I arrived home from a quick trip to town to grab a beer. As I got out of my car, I could hear something. 
I thought for a moment that I had left the TV on and was hearing it from the outside. But as I walked to the front of my car and pressed the lock button on my remote, I realized that what I was hearing was screaming. I listened for a second, thinking it was somebody screwing around, but then the woman's voice screamed, No, stop, you're hurting me, you're killing me, and an adult male voice yelling something I couldn't make out. There was a dog barking from the same direction as well as repeated thudding noises. I immediately dialed 911 one and told the police. They could even hear the screaming in the background. They said they'd send an officer to drive by, but an hour passed and none came. I watched for them on my security cameras. The camera on my back door only records when it detects a humanoid shape, so it caught me making the phone call and a little of the screaming in the background. The backyard camera caught it all, but it is unintelligible due to outdoor AC unit noise. I cleaned up the audio as best I could, but I need advice on how to proceed. I am attaching a Dropbox link to the video. I also included the original in the second half of the video. If you watch it, the screaming coming from directly where the camera is pointed, but more than 50 feet away across a narrow field. There is a small shack that has a couple of cars usually parked at the road, just on the other side of the field. It is bothering me a lot since I'm 41 years old and have never heard anything so disturbing in real life. Update, I guess they finally had a reason to go out and check the property I was trying to tell them to look at. There are sheriff's cars all over the place and cops in gloves walking in and out of this garage, and one cop throwing up in the front yard. I have a picture, but I can't add it to an update. So after listening to the camera audio, it is nearly impossible to discern any words that are being said as OP stated, but it's clear that someone is in distress. The original post was made in late July of 2021, so it took about two months before police actually investigated the matter. And based on OP's description, it definitely seems like someone lost their life that night. Who knows, if police took her seriously and investigated the property that same night it was reported, a life may have been saved. But then again, we aren't entirely sure if someone even died. At least, that was the case until OP gave an update saying, Welp, murder it is. I posted last year about coming home and hearing a female voice screaming for her life. I posted a video with the audio of the screen and got plenty of comments. About two months later, the house that it was coming from had the sheriff's cars all around it. I found out that an elderly man had committed suicide via gunshot, and that his son was the only person at home and the person who reported that his father had shot himself. Fast forward to last week, I was sitting at home watching YouTube when I heard gunshots. I live in the country and that's common, so I didn't think anything of it. Turns out, it was the sound of that son murdering his mother. He is trying to claim self-defense, but he is being charged with murder. I lived next door and my security cameras caught the audio of the murder. It also captures the vehicle the son made his getaway in. I've had detectives in and out gathering video footage for the past week. This is a family annihilator. They are now looking at him for the murder of his father as well. The case has been reopened and they have now recognized that my calls and reports were actually real. Two lives could have been saved. I'm going to link the story. Also, wouldn't Tim Johnson, the second Tim, be Tim Johnson Jr.? In the linked article, it was shared that the woman slash mother who died was named Stephanie Cheney. Her son, Tim Johnson II, was 40 years old at the time and admitted to taking his mother's life. The incident took place in Highland County, Ohio.
This next post was created in r slash rbi and was made by user paganprincess22. It was titled, A woman posing as a nurse stole my blood from Indiana, USA emergency room in 1996 to 1997, when I was 5 or 6 years old. Hello everyone, I'm not sure if this is the correct place, so feel free to direct me to a better subreddit if there is one. I flared it as a cold case because it happened 23 years ago, but there were never charges filed to my recollection and I don't remember a case being made from it. This is a strange story and I was 5, maybe 6 when it happened, so I don't have a lot of details. I had recently told my younger sister about this story and she encouraged me to look into the incident more and see if I can find out either who this person was or if there was a larger pattern of behavior during the time frame. I'm interested in any information you all have to offer slash can find on the matter as I truly just want to satisfy some curiosity. I'm 99% sure any statute of limitations is up, and I'm not interested in reporting something so weird and from so long ago to the police, for them to tell me that there's nothing that can be done. Now on to the story. When I was around 5 to 6, I got a pretty bad nosebleed that wouldn't stop. I eventually started throwing up big clots of blood as well and my mother took me to the ER. This would be in slash around the Sunman or Indianapolis area of Indiana in USA, but I do not know the name of the hospital. At the time, beds were separated only by curtains on ceiling tracks and not individual walled rooms. My mother had left my quote unquote room to speak to a doctor, I think, I know she left, and a woman I did not know came in shortly after she left. She was white, had medium brown hair, and looked to be in her 20s to 30s. She was wearing a blue scrub shirt with puppy dogs on it and unmatched pants. I want to say she was not wearing scrub pants, but rather jeans or maybe sweatpants. I know they did not match her shirt, which stood out to me. The other nurses and doctors I saw only wore solid colored scrubs and were all matched. She said she needed to take some blood and pulled the tools to do so from her scrub's pocket, not a phlebotomy cart. She stuck me and started drawing blood, somewhere around 5-7 to seven vials of it, but potentially more. On the last vial, we heard my mom and a doctor coming back towards the room. She hurriedly ripped the tube from my arm before the last vial was full. It spilled some blood. She did not give me a band-aid or gauze, she just left me bleeding, and shoved everything back into her pocket, then ran from the room. She ran to the left and my mom and doctor entered from the right. The doctor said a nurse would be with me soon to draw some blood and run some tests. I told him a lady had already taken my blood and he asked what she looked like and where she went. I described her, he turned wide eyed to my mother and said she doesn't work here and ran out of the room to the left. I heard some voices, there was a lot of commotion, but I don't remember anything past that point other than just feeling dizzy and now scared that some strange woman had my blood. I've never been able to find out what the hell happened, who this woman was, and if she was ever caught. If this type of thing was happening across the country at time, I have no idea. Let me know if there's any other information I could provide that might make it easier to find out what happened to my blood. Edited a typo and to add, my mother is not a great source of information information when it comes to my early life, or her life, or anything really, as she has some of her own issues. Several years ago when I was a teenager, she confirmed the details I remembered, then refused to talk further about it and asked me not to bring it up. She claims she does not remember the name of the hospital, the name of the doctor, or other details I was asking for at that time. This story is definitely pretty creepy as it's kind of grounded in reality. Whenever I'm put in a situation where I have to confide and trust in a professional or person of authority, I typically do it blindly. The thought that someone is masquerading as a health professional just so they can exploit me makes me wildly uncomfortable. Various Reddit users attempted to strum up theories to try and explain the story. One user suggested the possibility that OP was adopted and this fake nurse was actually OP's biological parent, stealing blood to prove that they were related. However, this was quickly shot down after OP stated that her birth certificate lists her two parents as her birth parents. Additionally, her physical appearance resembles both her mom and sister.
This entry was created by Reddit user Definitely Not Don't Look At Me. It was titled Try Out Super Yummy Gamer Subs Today and Use My Code DLAM at checkout for 10% off your purchase, or use the link in the description. I am one of those creatures that needs my daily fix of caffeine in the morning to get my day started, so that's why I'm happy to be partnering up with Gamer Subs to bring you all a discount. They sent me out some samples, and never in a million years would I have ever expected to say that I love titty milk. Gamersubs is a healthier alternative to your typical energy drink and much cheaper. You can get yourself 100 servings of titty milk or whatever flavor you want for just 40 cents a serving. You can also try out some of their other wacky flavors including Grandpa's Ashes, Guacamole Gamer Fart, Emotional Damage, and much more. Guacamole Gamer Fart was also surprisingly pretty good. Again, use my code DLAM, all caps, at checkout for a discount. I also get a bit of a kickback when you use my code so it helps out the channel as well, so it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you to Gamersubs for supporting the channel, and back to the video. So this entry was made on r slash popping over a decade ago where OP sent a photo of what I can only describe as flesh. This thing apparently came out of her reproductive organs, and I definitely cannot show you guys the actual photo, but good old Justin Wang talked about this six years ago on his channel, and this madman actually posted the photo, so if you want to bless your eyes with some good old flesh, check that video out. According to one user, this thing is an endometrium, which is just essentially tissue. Then another user said that it looks similar to bacon. This prompted OP to fry it in a pan and she claimed that it smelled amazing but they refrained from eating it. Just a strange post in general. This entry was posted in r slash ask reddit under a post that was asking people for the creepiest thing that has happened to them. One user by the name bingbong1234 said, I've been waiting a long time to tell reddit the full story of The Whistler. The story requires many details but it is unexplainable and 100% true. I also have video evidence. When I was about 8 years old, I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood with my mom. It was maybe 11pm. We live next to a swamp slash woody area on the edge of our neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan. I remember it being very silent and slightly windy. From down in the swamp, we heard somebody whistling at us. It sounded sort of like a bird, but each whistle was different enough where the lack of consistency made it human-like. The whistle sounded higher than lower. I can't really describe it. My mom had a concerned, slightly terrified look on her face and grabbed my hand and said that we should go inside quickly. I didn't understand because I was too young, but seeing my mom freak out made me freak out too. After a while though, I kind of forgot about it. Two years later, I was taking my dog out again late at night. There is a large bush that could easily obscure a person behind it just next to the front door. As I was finishing the walk, the whistling noise started again. Same pitches, same inconsistent human-like tones. As soon as I heard it, a chill went down my spine as I remembered exactly the feeling of seeing my mom, terrified, looking down into the swamp at something I couldn't see. Maybe she couldn't either. I ran inside as fast as possible. Years went by and I thought about it less and less. I told only a handful of people and eventually it slipped from my mind completely. Fast forward to last summer. I'm 24, started dating my girl Sarah. We moved out to South Dakota for work. For Independence Day, we decided to go to Pierre SD and watch the fireworks along the bank of the Missouri River. There was a free camping spot behind a hospital where you could pitch your tent, hang out, and see the fireworks up the river. We were near the end of the campground and there were very few people around us. As it was getting dark, the fireworks began. They were pretty far away, so the illumination they brought was very little. Thus, we had to sit right at the edge of the river to be able to see them. A huge thunderhead was moving in and a storm was imminent. Imminent, so the air seemed electric and the wind was picking up. The atmosphere was eerie to say the least. The police boats herded all the other boats off of the river and had left our area to do that elsewhere. Most of the other campers walked up the river to have a better view of the fireworks, but Sarah and I stayed back and were drinking PBR tall boys and kicking it. Suddenly, we heard the sound of a paddle methodically dipping into the water. We saw a figure steering a canoe about 20 meters offshore. Sarah decided to go 
get more beers from the car, leaving me alone to stare at this mystery person. And then, of course, they whistled at me. My entire body was frozen and covered in goosebumps. It was the exact same whistler from my childhood, more than a decade earlier. I looked at the figure, but it was much too dark to discern who it could be. They were wearing a hat. When they were perpendicular to the shore from me, they stopped paddling, turned the canoe to face directly at me, and whistled right at me. I was so frightened, I stood up and shouted at them, Who are you? They didn't say anything, just whistled a couple more times, turned the canoe 180 degrees, and paddled out of sight. I'm a videographer, so I already had my camera by my side and was taking videos of the fireworks. As the canoe was almost out of sight, I grabbed my camera and got a shot of them whistling as they went away. When Sarah came back from getting beers, she was very confused as to why I was so freaked out. When I explained, she was freaked out a bit too. I was convinced we would both be murdered that night. How did this whistling person follow me after 14 years all the way to South Dakota? Was it a coincidence? Why was it the same whistling noise? Who was that person and where did they go? So many questions still unanswered. To this day, I'm more afraid of being outside in the dark where I might hear that whistling again. I'm open to any explanations. If there is interest, I will find a plug and edit a little video of the fireworks and the whistling noise and the canoe disappearing. I'm in Uganda currently and the internet is spotty where I am, so I'll do my best. Edit. Video is coming, I promise. Where I'm at in Uganda, the power goes out sometimes, so if you don't hear from me, either that happened or the whistler finally got me. Edit 2. Okay, finally. I've spent all afternoon uploading this video. Here is the link to the video. Whistling. Is that you? Stop it. When I was still getting shots of the fireworks, I heard the whistling starting. I was too afraid at that moment to point the camera directly at the canoe, so I just turned my microphone towards it and kept a low-key shot facing downriver towards the fireworks. If you wear headphones, you can hear it better. It's the two-note whistle, high then low. You can hear me ask my GF, are you whistling? Is that you? She said no, but I wasn't sure, so I told her, stop it, because I was getting scared. The last shot, I boosted the brightness as much as I could and still make out the person in the canoe. It looks like they're wearing a red sweater or something. Edit. It's been a while and I apologize for that. I'm back in the US now and I asked my mom about it. I sat her down and played the video for her. She honestly doesn't remember anything like that happening. I wish I had something more exciting to say. Alas, it must remain a mystery. A lot of people believe that something supernatural is occurring here with OP. One user compared the Whistler to a Venezuelan legend referred to as El Sabon, which is said to be a translation of the Whistler. This user translated a bit of an article and asked OP if it was in any way similar to what they experienced. And again, this is translated, so some of the stuff might not make very much sense. 
The article said, the legend is that of a young man who killed his father as a revenge because he had killed his wife. After this event, his grandfather had him tied to a pole in the middle of a field and whipped him, had his wounds cleaned with drinking alcohol and released him with two rabid and hungry dogs, but before release, he cursed him to carry his father's bones for the rest of eternity. He has a particular whistling similar to music notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B in that order, going up to F and then going low to B. It's said that when whistling is heard closely, there is no danger because he is really far, but when the whistling sounds far, he is really close. It's also said that the whistling announces the death of those who hear it. He can be anywhere at any time. It seems that the only thing that can save the person that hears it from afar is the bark of a dog, because he is afraid of it, also of chili peppers and whips. The soul takes revenge on womanizing men. Many inhabitants of Los Llanos speak of seeing him, particularly during summer, season in which the Venezuelan savanna sears under the strength of drought and El Sabon sits in the stumps of trees and gathers dust with his hands, but he is primarily encountered in times of humidity and rain, when the specter roams hungry for death and avid to punish the drunk, the mongers, and from time to time, an innocent victim. It's said that he sucks on the navel of drunk men when he finds them alone to drink the alcohol that they drink, and he rips apart the mongers, he takes off the bones, and puts them inside the bag in which he carries his dad's remains. Some versions say that he looks like a long giant, six meters tall, who walks from treetop to treetop while he emits his terrifying whistling and rattles inside the dusty old bag. The pale bones of his misfortune father, or as some claim, his multiple victims. Other versions state that he presents as the shade of a tall and slender man with a hat, especially to drunk people. It is said that El Sabon may appear near a house on some nights, leaving the bag on the floor and counting the bones one by one. If one or more people hear him, nothing will happen, but if no one hears, by dawn a family member will die in his sleep. The Colombian Eastern Llanos, where he is called El Silvador, they believe is the wandering soul of a party-loving womanizer who died in solitude, and people claim that he seeks the company of someone who dares ride horseback late at night. Also in Colombia, some others say he chases pregnant women, that his whistling penetrates the ear, chills, and that, if someone hears a high pitched tone, it omens the death of a woman, while a low pitched tone omens the death of a man. In any case, that woman or man is generally someone known by the one that heard the whistling. Of course, whenever it comes to the topic of the supernatural, many people are skeptical, but let me know what you think in the comments. This post was created in r slash confessions on January 19th, 2017 by user throwaway181718. It was titled, I was in a cult. Firstly, apologies for my anonymity. I don't want this to get back to me but I haven't told anyone about this. I need to get it off my chest. Three years ago when I was in college, I was suffering with severe depression. I took medication and attended therapy and group therapy. One day in my group therapy, our therapist told us that there's a man here to talk to us. For reasons, let's call him Bob. Bob was really energetic, really friendly and understanding. He spoke to us on our level, a bunch of vulnerable teenagers. He told us about a group therapy holiday. We go away over the summer holidays and do some cool things like rafting, rock climbing, etc. He explained that it was completely free because the college would pay for us to go and it lasts 5 weeks. Not many people were interested, but I decided to ask him a few questions after the session. He told me that it was all about adventure, making friends, and having fun, whilst continuing our therapy. I asked for some details off him, but he didn't have a card, so he asked for mine. Stupidly, I gave him my phone number, email address, and home address. Later that night, I was telling my parents about it. They seemed a little suspicious, but I was trying to convince them. Whilst we were talking, there was a knock at the door. It was Bob. My dad welcomed him in, and he spoke to both of them, explaining that it is good for my mental health, and it's also a lot of experiences, as well as completely free. After talking for a while, my parents agreed that I could go. They filled out some paperwork, and the next time I saw Bob was when I got on the coach, with lots of other people around my age. Bob was really enthusiastic, and everyone looked excited, albeit we were all having mental health issues. 
Bob explained that on our first day, we would be doing an adventure course and building a raft to help with teamwork with our fellow campers. We drove north to a walled off campsite. It was huge. As we got off the bus, everyone had to go for a physical checkup. It was uncomfortable, but I assumed it was to make sure we could take part in the events. The doctor was very thorough. When we left, we couldn't find our suitcases, so we guessed they were brought to our rooms. But when we got to our rooms, they weren't there either. I asked Bob and he said we weren't allowed them and we weren't allowed phones either. He asked for all our phones, me and the other boys in my room refused, but then he said that it was in the contract we signed. Reluctantly, we all gave up all our possessions and he gave us these ugly tracksuits to wear because we didn't want our nice clothes to get dirty. We did some activities and they were fun, but then we all went for dinner. Before anyone started eating, one of the group leaders said that we should all pray. I'm not religious and there wasn't any indication that this was a religious group, so I was a bit confused. The group leader said we should be thankful towards the gods for bringing us all together. I thought that this was weird, but thought that he was just being inclusive of everyone's religions. Later that night, we all went to bed. That same night, another group leader named Todd came in and forced us all to stand up. He told us off for sleeping in our boxers and said that we should sleep in our tracksuits. So we put them on, but then took them back off after he left. It was summer after all. It was really hot. The next few days were pretty much all the same. There were some fun group activities, but they all ended with the group leaders acting very strange and rather strict. The boys and girls were not allowed to talk to each other. When we went swimming, we went in our tracksuits and were only really allowed to talk to each other during these activities. Every meal, we had to pray and the leader would say something like, the gods will show us the way to the end. We did exciting activities and some boring ones that included meditation. We were told that we could stay after the five weeks and if we wanted, we could even invite our families. One evening, I asked Bob if I could call my family because I wanted to talk to them, but he said that he already told my family that I had arrived safely. I insisted, but we got in an argument and Bob said that I could not call my family until the five weeks were up. They took my suitcase, so I had no way to find my stuff. That evening, there was a campfire event. It was integrated with the group therapy session. I asked to use the bathroom and went off in search of my stuff. I snuck into an office where there was a phone that I used to call home. I told my mom what was happening and she said that they'd be there right away to pick me up. In the back room was a bunch of suitcases and a plastic box filled with phones. It took a while to find my phone, but I found it and snuck it in my pocket. Then I tried looking for my suitcase, but Todd walked into the office and found me. He practically dragged me out and sat me down in the hallway. He yelled at me for disobeying the rules. He took me back to the group and told me to stay put. He then told the other group leaders what had happened and they were all angry, so they went over all of the rules. We were then all sent back to our room without dinner. In bed, I was texting my dad who said they were arriving now. I made sure the other boys didn't see my phone. At some point, my dad texted me saying that they were outside, so I pretty much jumped out of bed and ran towards the entrance. The group leaders tried to stop me, but luckily I was able to get past them. Down the dirt road at the edge of the campsite, I could see the car. During this time, all of the group leaders were chasing me. My dad got out of the car and when I got in, my mom locked us in. The group leaders were saying that we signed a contract and that I was not allowed to leave until the five weeks were over. My dad refused and they tried to open the doors. Somehow, my dad got back in without letting any of the group leaders in. At home, I told my parents everything. The next morning, Todd and everyone else were at my front door. My dad told them to go away as they tried to get me to come back. My dad said no and called the police who escorted them away. I pretty much never left the house all summer, but when I started college and went to my bus, I could hear Todd and his group chasing after me. They surrounded me on the street, but neighbors heard all of the commotion and some people came out and a fight broke. I was able to get back to my house and lock myself in. The group leaders were arrested when police arrived, but the next week, a new group of people under Todd came to our neighborhood. I stopped going to college and my family and I had to move to a new area. We started a whole new life. We weren't in a witness protection program, but we used fake names and identities to prevent them from finding us. My mom called the college and the police and we learned that Todd had taken his own life. I don't know much else than that, but I hope everyone else in the group is okay. So this original post is now deleted, but quite a few large YouTubers have touched upon this topic and it seems there's a split amongst people who think it's real or fake.
OP would later make an update to the post saying, I never intended for this to be a potential way of exposing the group, and I didn't expect it to have such a huge and supportive reaction. As some of you have some questions, I'd love to answer them, but still, I wish to remain anonymous and not give away too much information. In response to all the questions about my phone, I didn't think it was worth mentioning that I turned it off before I handed it over. I haven't heard from any of the teenagers in the group since I left, and I haven't heard from the leaders since we moved houses. There was an investigation a few years ago and I don't know what has happened to the group. Some of you have guessed my country, but still, I don't want to give away too much information about where I live. The reason I won't expose the group is because it would be interfering with the police investigation, if it's still ongoing, and it would bring more attention to myself. When I said we changed identities, I mean we unofficially have started using a new surname. Only our closest relatives know this. We didn't take out a restraining order because it would only lead to court cases and a potential threat to our family. As explained above, a group of the leaders were arrested and charged with harassment. However, more people turned up soon after. I am scared of even googling the group name, as I know that if they tracked me down, it wouldn't end well. I hope you all understand the position I'm in and know that for my family and my own protection, I can't give more than that. I also wanted to say thanks for all the supportive messages. You guys really are the greatest community. Maybe one day there will be a complete resolution to this and I'll be able to tell the full story to you all. So it's clear that OP dislikes the group, but at some point down the line, he would make this comment. This is not true. I was part of a therapy group that specializes in helping teenagers with mental health problems. It was not a cult. Since then, I have decided to rejoin the group. I will answer no further questions on this matter. Very interesting. Some users suspected that the group somehow got their hands on OP and his account and made this post themselves. And OP would disappear for about 5 years before making a post in r slash doll photography saying, Hello, I am fine. Thank you for your concern. Which is the strangest place to leave this update. This update was made on January 1st, 2023. Fast forward one month on February 1st, OP made this post. Hi, I think it's time for things to finally come to light. For the people that are still following this story, this will be my last post. Strap in because it's a long one. Back in 2011, I was studying at college in the UK. Like a lot of teens, I was struggling with my mental health and I'm lucky that my college had a good support network in place for people like me. My college offered me private therapy and got in contact with my doctor to arrange medication. They really helped me. One day, during a private therapy session, I was told about a group that works with college students with mental health problems and was invited to attend a meeting to see what they do. There were about 20 students listening to these two men talking about an exciting opportunity for us, where they would take us to a camp where we could do adventurous things such as rock climbing and archery. But the main goal was to help us learn more about our mental health and through group sessions eventually work through our problems. I signed up. I gave them my contact details, but they said they would need parental permission before I go. I didn't realize that they would show up at my house that evening. I hadn't even had a chance to tell my parents about it. The two men were very persuasive and made the trip sound very enticing to me, but my parents had their doubts. My mom was very suspicious about them showing up to our house unannounced and the long contract that they brought with them. My parents refused to let me go, saying it sounds like a cult, and escorted the men out. And that was it. I had nothing more to do with them. I have no idea what happened at that group, but I doubt it was a cult. In fact, it was probably a charity funded group that had genuine and selfless intentions, but I understand my parents' skepticism. I don't know anyone who went to the camp and I can't remember the name of the organization, and I continued with my private therapy. Fast forward a few years and I'm sitting at my desk at my very first office job, bored mindless and listening to a podcast series about creepy stuff that's happened around the world. One of the episodes was about Heaven's Gate, a famously tragic cult where the founder sought out people who were marginalized, lost, and had mental health issues to join their group. 
The story triggered some creativity inside me and led me to r slash confessions. The story didn't take me long, I was just letting the creative juices flow as my co-workers looked on, probably thinking I was working on something really important. But yes, the truth is, is that it was just a spooky story with far too many inconsistencies. This wasn't the first fictional story I posted on Reddit. I found a lot of enjoyment writing weird posts and watching the commenters try to decipher it. One of my personal favorites was a story from the perspective of an American lady convinced that her vegan neighbors were witches. None of these posts gained a lot of attention and I didn't mind, I just enjoyed the writing. About a week after the original post, I was watching a YouTube video about Reddit mysteries. This obviously inspired me to ignore my work and try to flesh out this cult story. The intention behind the creepy update was that the cult leaders had somehow gained access to my account and were desperately trying to get rid of the evidence. I wasn't expecting this update to bring as much attention to my story as it did. Reading through all of these theories was really enjoyable for me, even if half of the commenters knew it was fake. There were a few people that seemed to really enjoy digging into the story and it made me feel happy that I provided them with something they could try to figure out. A few more years later, one night, I got into bed and opened up YouTube on my phone. I can't explain the feeling of seeing my stupid story being the focus of one of my favorite YouTubers, Nightmare Expo. I was overwhelmed with joy that he had decided to use my story for one of his videos. The feeling was remarkable. With this video came a lot more attention and a lot more theories. My biggest regret is that I didn't make up a name for this cult because I feel bad that negative attention was being put on random organizations because of this. I tried to be vague to avoid people pointing fingers of who could be behind the cult, and that was pretty much the height of the story. A silly fictional story that I wrote at my desk instead of doing work. Throughout the years since I've logged into this account and read through the direct messages and checked the new comments under Nexpo's video, I had a lot of fun reading all of your theories and have a lot of love for those who reached out in an effort to help this supposed troubled person. I understand a lot of people were annoyed because they could tell the story was fake. Fake, but I still hope that people who took time to work together and investigate the story had some fun too. I've been part of online communities investigating some internet mysteries and it's where I've met some close friends. So that leads us up to now and why I've decided to close this story. The initial intention was to let it fade into nothingness like most other reddit mysteries, but something changed. About a year ago, I got some bad news from my doctor. Two months ago, I was told that the treatment wasn't working. I haven't got long left. Since I was a teenager, I've always had a fascination with all things spooky. This fascination has got me through some tough times, especially recently when I've needed distractions from the real world. I've spent countless hours in hospitals and clinics investigating online mysteries and feeding my obsession of the weird and wonderful. I've also spent a lot of time reading through theories about my story and I'm happy that some of you found it interesting. But I couldn't take this with me to the grave. Along with letters for my family and friends, I had to leave one for you guys too. To the people at r slash confessions and r slash rbi, to Nightmare Expo and his fans, and to everyone who spent some time exploring this story, thank you. I hope you guys can keep internet mysteries alive, keep investigating, and keep making these online communities going. Please remember to do what you enjoy doing, like I did, while you have the time. Love, throw away 18, 17, 18. This entry involves a Reddit user that goes by the name Forlearn, whose real name was Will. We'll begin with a post that Will posted in 2018. He showed off a picture of severely frostbitten feet on r slash medical gore. YouTube will definitely not like it if I posted the pictures in their entirety, but they are available online. About half of both feet were completely black as a result of the frostbite. In the comments, he said the following. 24 hours in freezing temperatures with wet socks. This happened three weeks ago. I will have a double below the knee amputation in two days. I don't so much see it as losing my legs as I see it as gaining a lack of legs. I also have a ton of pictures of its progression if anybody is interested. This happened because I thought it would be smart to sleep in my car and save money by not getting a motel. My boss was coming back from being out of town the next day, at which we were going to go to Wisconsin and work there for a few weeks where we had lodging set up. 
My shoes were wet from walking around in the fresh snow a bit, so I took them off. I had the heat on and figured my socks would dry out pretty quickly. Sometime while I was asleep, I ran out of gas. I figured I could just tough it out and figure something out in the morning, feet hurt really bad for a while. Then they just stopped hurting altogether. I went back to sleep. A few hours later, I tried to put my shoes back on and found that my feet were frozen solid. My hands were very painful now and were beginning to lose most of their mobility and sensation to touch. I contacted an ambulance and went to the hospital. Once the feet began to thaw, all of the pain came back. It has been the most painful thing I have ever experienced. Doctors had hoped some of the flesh in my feet would receive adequate circulation and some of the foot could be saved. This has not been the case and both will be removed on the morning of Friday, January 26th. I'm looking forward to cutting these damn things off as massive nerve damage is a shitty thing to be stuck with. I am also excited to start working with prosthetics. Once I get comfortable with prosthetics, there will be very little I won't be able to do that I could have done with real legs. I was a pretty lazy, unhappy, and unmotivated person before all of this happened. I am looking at this as a second chance. Every day I will appreciate that with a bit of work, I can go out and be active and do things that make me happy. So please do not feel sorry for me, soon I will be running and jumping and possibly skipping again. Unless skipping requires a specialized type of prosthetic. I ain't paying for some fancy prosthetic just to skip around. So all things considered, OP has a very positive mindset towards his situation. I know personally if I was in a similar predicament, I wouldn't be nearly as optimistic. And this holds true for probably 90% of people, which led some Reddit users to question whether or not this optimism was genuine. What people specifically had in mind were the painkillers. Will even shared in his comment that he was rather unhappy and unmotivated before this incident. He added to his earlier comment and said, I have a lot of moments where I find myself depressed or just plain terrible. But I found it's possible to not dwell on those thoughts and that there are reasonable and logical ways to look at this that don't make me want to jump out of a window or curl up into a ball and die. I think it would be a lot easier to just mourn for my loss and obsess over the negative side of the situation. It takes a concerted effort to keep positive and one way of doing that is by joking around about it with my friends and now folks on Reddit. The only fear I can't really shake is what it will be like the first time I look down and instead of feet, there's just nothing. I have no idea how I'll react to that, but in any case, I can guarantee that it won't break me. The day eventually came for Will's procedure and he would send pictures as well as updates regarding his situation. One of the photos that Will shared was taken well after the procedure and showed him sitting in a wheelchair preparing to get fitted for his prosthetics. And here we can see the state of his legs. At some point, Will took a bit of a break from Reddit as he was beginning to become a bit annoyed that his entire being was being defined by his injury. Will sort of became a small online celebrity with his post going viral. This hiatus went on for about 4 months. When he returned, he would update Reddit saying the following, Howdy y'all, I'm still kicking just a shorter distance. Issues with stump swell are making fitting prosthetics and walking difficult, but I am currently in therapy for gait training and get up when I can. Thank you all for thinking of me. It feels very nice. So it's good to see that Will is still cracking jokes and seems to be in good spirits. Although it's tough not to think of the possibility that perhaps his situation is starting to wear down on him. Every single time he logs onto Reddit, he's bombarded with questions and comments about his legs, constantly being reminded about his loss. Fast forward to September 2021, a tragic post was made on Reddit regarding Will. It was titled, Incredibly Sad News, User for Learn Has Passed Away, from a Facebook post made by his mother. It is with our deepest sadness that we share with you the passing of our son William on August 17th, 2021. Will was 33 and we find comfort and peace in the memories we have of him. Say not in grief that they are gone, but give thanks that they were yours. I don't want to dox his family or him, so I redacted his last name and am not posting the obituary that I found on Google. I can message these to user PoopDog if needed. I'm not aware of any other details surrounding his passing unfortunately. If I hear about anything else, I'll post about it. 
I'll just add that Will was a genuinely special dude with a true intelligence, a sharp and weird sense of humor, and a thoughtfulness that made you want to talk with him. While we fell out of touch after high school about 15 years ago, I'll always have great memories of spending time with him back then. He'll be missed. Rest in power, bud. One of Will's online friends began to do a bit of digging and contacted Will's family, specifically his mother, to find out a bit more as to what had happened. According to Will's mom, he had passed away as a result of alcohol poisoning. In stark contrast to what was seen online, Will was actually at the lowest point in his life. While Will painted this image of an optimistic man online, in reality, he was coping with his situation with alcohol. Will's close online friend, Poop Dog, later made a post on r slash morbid reality providing more details. It said, I was involved with a guy who became a double below the knee amputee. His name was Will. He was 30 when he fell asleep in a freezing car in December 2017 and woke up with frostbite. He was a semi-transient character who was traveling for construction jobs. He usually stayed in cheap motels, but in an effort to save money, one night he decided to sleep in his freezing car in a town outside of Chicago called Midlothian. He woke up to his feet being rock solid, and within a short time, they were amputated. He almost lost his hands too, but they were able to be saved, albeit with some nerve damage. The first few months where he was grateful to be alive after his accident, while he was all pumped full of stuff, were full of hope and laughs and family and friends and kind doctors. He went viral on Reddit, he was in the news, he got money and gifts from strangers, he got fitted for some cool prosthetics, he took physical therapy to help him learn to walk, he became close again with his estranged family. Besides losing his feet, it was actually one of the best times of his life. I can't say exactly when things changed, maybe around 6 months later. Reality hit him hard. He didn't have insurance, so he had to live in a nursing home in an unfamiliar place where he was surrounded by burnt out CNAs and people several decades older than him. And he wasn't even allowed to go outside without permission. He had to share a room with an incontinent dementia patient. When he was fully quote unquote recovered, they took his pain and anxiety meds away. His family forgot about him again. He couldn't find work because he was not computer illiterate. He didn't have any friends who lived near him. He could never secure a physical therapy appointment. He developed phantom pain. Suddenly, he was in debt and had no income. He couldn't really pursue many hobbies from where he was because he had almost none of his belongings. He quickly became horribly depressed, which doctors did not medicate him for. He stopped trying to learn to walk again and his prosthetics said unused next to his bed. He once had someone sneak a little alcohol in for him, but he got caught and the medical staff treated it like a suicide attempt, so he was 5150'd. All he really had was his phone and a laptop to keep him busy slash entertained. He was stuck like that in the nursing home for over two years. Finally, he was able to move to an assisted living facility in Chicago that allowed him some freedom. Basically, an apartment complex with some medical staff and accommodations for disabled folk. The first thing he did was start drinking. Hard. And that was all he did. All day, every day, until he died of acute alcohol poisoning around 6 months later on August 17th, 2021 at age 33. The facility he lived in was in the same city where his sister lived and she never once came to see him. His family did not hold a memorial service or a funeral for him. They did not even print an obituary. They cremated him immediately. All he got was a two sentence Facebook post from his mom. I tried to take some responsibility in keeping his memory alive post mortem, but his mom fought to keep me out of it and unfortunately she won. The accident that took his legs did not directly or immediately kill him, but it was ultimately responsible for his death. The subreddit he created to document his journey after he went viral is r slash chilichomp adventures. Obviously, it's not really active anymore, but it's up. I miss him. Thank you for reading. 
for our first entry, we'll be observing a Redditor spiral into madness, so to speak. The user is basically having an existential crisis. It seems that his madness started around February 2017 with this post. The theory of quantum immortality has driven me to a really dark place. I'm living in a state of pure terror. Is there reason not to believe it is true? Can it be debunked? User AFH43 posted this same concern on several different subreddits, but it never really caught on and they never received a satisfying answer. One of the other posts said, The theory of quantum immortality has driven me to a state of pure anxiety and terror over the last week. Is it true? Has it been debunked? I can't do this anymore. A user named John Hassler replied with the following, Quantum immortality just means that you will never wake up dead. Think about it. The only state you will ever observe yourself to be in is alive. That's only one of the problems with it. Another is that death is not an instantaneous quantum transition. It's a slow, messy process by which the collection of atoms that you are currently pleased to call me become so disorganized as to be unable to call themselves anything and then begin to stink. You will likely be there for much of the process and know what is happening. Don't worry, you are in no danger of being forced to live forever against your own will. OP would go on to ask John if his statement would make the theory illegitimate, which prompted the following comment. What do you think you are? Why do you think that death, which is just another macroscopic physical process like spraining your ankle, will create some sort of continuity between you and one, but only one, of the myriad states of the universe in which you do not die? And what about the past states in which you did die? Did they all somehow coalesce into you? The line of reasoning that leads you to believe that you will live forever, quantum immortality, must also lead to the conclusion that you will die forever. If you're asking yourself what quantum immortality even is right now, it gets very convoluted and like with most thought experiments, I just get really effing confused. So I'm going to read this example word for word as it's probably the easiest way to understand it. So there's this device that goes off every few seconds and when it does, the universe will either cease to exist, which would mean you're dead or nothing happens, meaning you're alive. So each time the device triggers, the universe splits, and there is one version of you that is dead and another where you're still alive. But in the version that you are dead, you won't know that you're dead. Only the version of you that survived knows that you lived, so you're considered immortal. And maybe I'm just too smooth brain for this, but it just seems like a pointless thought to me. Anyway, OP is terrified at the thought that he possibly can never die. And from that initial post onwards, OP's account has nothing but conversations revolving around quantum immortality. Over the span of about half a week, OP made about a dozen posts about the same topic. Then on February 6th of the same year, they make this post. Quantum immortality. I'm taking my own life soon. It's too much. I can't do it anymore. Afterwards, there would be no activity on his account, so it seemed like the guy really went through with it. Either that, or this entire rabbit hole was a hoax. But fast forward to 2019, it seems like AFH is still alive. In r slash relationship advice, AFH resurfaced and made the following post. While recovering from a psychotic breakdown slash attempt, I met the only girl I have ever fallen in love with. Due to my state, it didn't work out. I am considering asking her out again. I am AFH43, a regular feature on those dark slash creepy reddit history threads. I am still alive. It's been a long time since I have logged into this account. I thought it had been long forgotten by everyone. However, after logging in a few days ago, I saw that my inbox was full of hundreds of messages from people asking how I am, or whether I am even alive. I also saw that my username had been mentioned in a lot of dark, creepy reddit history ask reddit posts. These were extremely hard for me to read because I try not to think about that time in my life. Nearly three years ago, I woke up one morning and my mind simply broke. I believe that because of quantum immortality, I would never be able to die and therefore would experience all of the greatest sufferings possible over and over again for all eternity. I felt there was no escape. It was like a panic attack of the highest intensity that did not end for weeks. For the first time, I understood what Emil Charan meant when he said, We dread the future only when we are not sure we can end it when we want to. Surviving a 
attempt only worsened my delusions. It was only once I started on medication during my stay in a psych ward that I began to put the pieces of my life back together and return to normality. It was during the process of getting back on my feet that I met a girl whom I completely fell for. We went on a few dates, we even kissed, but because of what I was going through, I was so nervous around her that it made things a bit awkward and I was very much emotionally closed up. I think I just tried too hard to make something happen. I just wasn't ready. I was still recovering from a truly traumatic and horrific experience that had completely shattered my mind. I only really started to become myself, to come out of my shell, after we stopped seeing each other and I began my first relationship with another girl. My girlfriend was a pretty incredible person and over the last year with her, I learned to enjoy life, to become free and uninhibited by anxieties. I became open, I became comfortable with myself and who I was and with the constraints on my existence. I made peace with my experience with my delusions. Today I am happy and in control of my life, truly. So all in all, OP seems to be in a pretty good mental state right now. He even says that he is happy. However, this wouldn't last long as in 2022, AFH made another post updating followers about his life. I'm still here. For a few years, my life has been pretty good, but at the moment I'm having an unrelated breakdown and I'm in the hospital for other mental reasons. I wish I could end it, but I'm still too scared. Maybe it's worth facing it though. I'll have to face death eventually. I'm stuck in hell and my life is effed. I might turn to other things to have some relief from this relentless pain. I just need to sleep and never wake up. Maybe that could be my reality. I just can't do this. I feel alone. I'm terrified and numb at the same time. The default state of my life is suffering. If anyone can dissuade me from quantum immortality, please tell me, but please don't make it worse for me. I'm in agony. Nothingness is a beautiful thing. I just want out. I know it will transfer the pain to other people and that makes me feel horrible. I wish I didn't have these beliefs. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here right now. Since my last post, I've been diagnosed with OCD and that explains a lot. I've been given Seroquel today to help me start thinking rationally. This may sound stupid, but this situation has to do with heartbreak and very specific and absurd triggering factors related to it. Maybe that sounds stupid, but I found love, real love, and now it might be over. Life is suffering. I am suffering. I don't want to be here anymore. I wish this was physical pain instead. I really envy Emil Charon. It was a wonderful fantasy to him at times, because at any moment he knew he could escape and that gave him immense comfort. My mind is broken and I don't think I'll ever be able to fix it. This next entry was created in January of 2019 by user tbug411. They stated that when staying at a hotel, a woman had made her way into their room through a hole that was hidden behind a mirror. The post itself was titled, Florida woman crawled out of my hotel mirror to rob me. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and I saw someone in the bathroom. I said, hello. Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason. And then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, what are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked, how it still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. This woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, what's in the bag? Thinking it is probably my stuff and so she said, no, no, it's just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. I looked and I didn't see anything of mine and so I'm obviously in shock at this time. I let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the 
bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at the moment other than I wanted it back. So I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the sides of the hotel and I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her, so my coworker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what happened and then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait and I noticed that there is a metal bat on my bed a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you can get at a baseball game game, but there's also a flashlight on the end. She must have left it behind in her hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought that she'd gotten away with my medication that I need. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink and I pointed that out to the cops but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she pried her way in somehow but there was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front front desk was adamant that there's no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup because they thought that the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink and it still didn't make sense to me. So I'm on the phone and looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it. And then it hit me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull at this mirror on the wall. And we took the mirror down and there's a hole there just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I found this and my boss said there's still two cop cars in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kinda rolled her eyes but the young guy said I'll come check it out. They both came back up, looked in the hole, and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for god knows how long. She had access to me and my room at all times. I know it might be hard to picture, there was a crawl space about 2 feet wide in between the two rows of rooms. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what's going on and all I hear over the radio is no effing way. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier is she has probably been there a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and it was traveling through the vents. But nope, a junkie was smoking just on the other side of my mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the walls were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. Anyway, this was insane and I'm taking a little time off. Posting from mobile, so sorry if the formatting is off. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM, which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Farts. It also supports the channel, so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now back to the video. This entry focuses on a reddit user named Cash22, an account which has been banned. The person behind this account took to reddit to share his desire to be with someone. This attraction gets out of hand and well it's probably easier to explain if I just read his posts. Cash22 initially drew concern when this post was made in r slash confessions. I spy on my soulmate. As long as they have their phone on them, they go to the store, I can see. They're at home, I can see. I check very often, seeing where they are. I just like to feel close to them, even when we are not physically close. And I like to think about what they're doing. The only downside is I can't see them. 
Sometimes I think I want to make them a plushie and hide cameras in their eyes so that in their bedroom I can see them sleep. But I'm worried that they may get changed there. If they do and then find out I put cameras there, they'd feel like I spied on something too personal, even though it isn't my intent. And I want to lock them up in a cage in the basement, also lined with cameras so I can watch them when I'm busy, they're so cute. Another post titled, I want to keep my partner locked up in my basement, said, I began cataloging my partner's interests and aesthetic choices more than usual because we started making plans to move out together because I want to make a safe haven for them in the basement. I'm not going to lock them up against their will and, of course, we are going to share a normal bed together like any couple. I know which carpet they have in their current room, their favorite brands of consumables, the media they're a fan of, and their favorite favorite plushies. Just to keep them safe from the outdoor world if I have to go away to work and can't bring them. I would love to hire them eventually so we don't have to be apart but I kind of have my business on the back burner right now. It's not very big slash active. Let them stay in there, locked safely with cameras so I can be sure they're okay and they can have fun while being safe. They can text me too, keep their phone and everything. I'm not interested in controlling their entire life. I know it's probably weird, but I just want to keep them safe to the point where I think about this almost constantly. So OP is definitely unwell, and it gets even darker when he shares that he plans to actually kidnap his so-called partner. I have a strong desire to kidnap my partner. I can't sleep sometimes because it bothers me that they're not with me. Whenever they do anything when I'm not there, I don't stop them because I respect their autonomy. I have the urge to just lock them away from the world in a containment room slash chamber slash cage so that I can always have them to myself. When they tell me about things they want or enjoy having, my brain sometimes drifts away to thoughts of how to implement these things in my own space so that I could hold them captive here in a way that would be least painful for them. I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I am obsessed with the idea. It's constantly on my mind and hard to ignore, but I don't want to do this to hurt them, just to keep and protect them. I'm extremely obsessed with my partner. I think about them all the time, to the extent where it's hard for me to sleep or work when they're not there, because I think about them and the things I'd like to do with them so much. I've had a crush on this person for over a decade, and I'm happy that we finally started dating, but I feel like it's making me go insane. I constantly think about locking them up. I feel ill when they're not talking to me, especially when they're awake. I feel an intense need to protect them. I hate their friends. I hate anything that keeps them from me at any point on either end. I want to marry them so badly, but we haven't even been on our first proper date yet, despite being an item for months now. They told me they weren't really into the idea of marriage, but another time, I accidentally referred to myself as their husband instead of boyfriend and they ignored it, so maybe they're more open to it. I don't know, but either way, it's something I think about constantly. There are many people who stumble upon this account and believe OP to be some sort of troll. However, if this was true, the person behind the account is extremely dedicated, as the post that we just went over is a small fraction of what he shared. OP talked about this unhealthy fondness towards their partner several times a day on Reddit, and he did this for weeks on end. This post was created back in early 2018 by user FYourCoconut. It was made on r slash JustKnowMIL, which they subreddit with about 2 million members, dedicated to discussing issues people are having with their mother or mother-in-law. The sub itself says, It's a place to post about your MIL or mother who is just the worst. Come for support, come for advice, or just event and get it all out. That's what we're here for. This post states that OP's mother had inadvertently killed one of their kids via the use of coconut oil. Hello, I am a first time poster, but I discovered this subreddit a few months ago. I was talking about this subreddit with my therapist and she gave me the homework of speaking out more about my story to see if it lessened my pain. I've written and deleted this post maybe 7 times now, but I think it's time to get it out. I've spoken English for 30 years, but it's not my first language and occasionally I use the wrong word because that's what the direct translation is, so I apologize in advance if I confuse anyone. 
one. This is going to be a long post as I'm a rambler and there is a lot of background involved. Trigger warning, a mother-in-law who doesn't believe in allergies and the price I paid for it, child death. This happened 12 years, 2 months, and 13 days ago on Wednesday, November 2nd, 2005. My DH got married in 2002 and had our son 10 months later in the same year. In May 2004, we welcomed our twin girls. My family was beautiful. Every time I took a picture of us, we looked like the families in the stock photos you can google for. My DH is an engineer and I'm a college professor. We had a nice house in the city. Our children were healthy and happy. We even had a golden retriever named Argo as if we weren't the picture of familial happiness as is. I can no longer look at the pictures of us because it makes me too angry too. When my twin girls were born, we had no issues in the hospital. They were born right on their due date, latched perfectly, and passed all their postnatal tests with stellar stats. When we brought them home, however, we noticed that one of the girls was developing a rash. Let's call her OD since she was a whole four and a half minutes older than her sister. I hadn't really dealt with allergies in kids since my son didn't have them and neither did any child or adult in my entire family. I wasn't sure what it was. I thought that maybe she just had sensitive skin like me. I can't tolerate certain fabrics because I have very dry skin and I'll often break out in rashes if my skin decides that it doesn't like something. So I stopped using fabric softener on all the clothes. I bought the nicest, most comfortable bedding and clothing. At one point, I even made her clothes myself in the fear that maybe something in the manufacturing process was upsetting my OD. We went to the doctor several times and they knew that she was having an allergic reaction to something, but every test came back negative and we couldn't figure out what it was. It took three more months to figure it out. During that time, her allergic reactions got more and more severe. At one point, she was the only baby in the history of the hospital who had to be kept in a clean room because she seemed to have have a reaction the minute she left. When that happened, we began an elimination therapy that would rival the lifestyle of Buddhist monks. My husband and I moved our son and YD in with his parents because we needed to eliminate everything from our routine to figure out what was causing the reaction in our OD. We stopped using our soap, our shampoo, our deodorants, our laundry detergents, and that was before we even got to our diet. It took us three more months, but we figured it out. Our OD was allergic to coconut. The doctors told us that it was a particularly rare allergen, and so it wasn't on any of the skin test panels they ran. When we found out what she was allergic to, we were relieved. So, so relieved. But in addition to feeling relieved, I delved into hysterical laughter. I laughed so hard I cried, and to this day, my DH tells me that he didn't know if I was crying from relief or pure happiness. You see, I come from a culture that uses coconut almost religiously. It's in our cooking. We break a coconut open at religious events. It's used in almost all sweets. It's in everything. The reason I was laughing was because of how much I hated one particular use for coconut. When I was a kid, pretty much up until I was in the 8th class, my mother would put coconut oil in my hair all the time. It looked greasy as hell. I hated it. And once I was old enough to start doing my own hair, I never put that stuff in my hair again. I was laughing so hard because, of course, I had a daughter with a severe allergy to the one thing I hated my entire life. We had a lot of fun telling people about her allergy and everyone laughed because they all knew about my hatred towards coconut oil. We told my mother and she laughed as well. She made jokes about how my baby must have heard me talking about my hatred for coconut oil while she was still cooking inside me and decided that she needed to hate it too. We all had a good laugh and left it at that. Or so I thought. My mother and I have always had a contentious relationship at best. We got along well enough, but we disagreed on certain topics. She wanted a traditional daughter who would be religious, get her MRS degree, marry a man that she and my father picked out, common where I'm from, have two kids, a house in the suburbs near her, and be a stay-at-home mom like her. I'm not religious in the slightest. I got two undergraduate degrees, went on to get a master's and a PhD, didn't get married until 27, late in my culture and I married a man who was the polar opposite of what my parents wanted. 
As if this wasn't enough, I was a working mom who didn't need her to babysit since my husband and I made more than enough for a part-time nanny. Essentially, the best way I could summarize our relationship is by saying that she was very proud of me and loved to talk about my accomplishments, but I could always tell that she wished I was something else. We have a fair amount of safe topics that we can talk about, but I could never discuss anything too serious with her such as politics or my career. Not because she'd get mad at me but more so because she just wasn't interested and I hate getting into conversations where I'm passionate about something but the other person could care less. As far as raising my kids, my mother was a just yes 99.9% .9 of the time. She was hands off and respected all of my decisions, even if she didn't like them sometimes. The only thing she continually got on my case about was the coconut oil thing. You see, my girls have very textured and curly hair. We don't really know where they got it from considering my husband and I have pinned straight hair that won't even hold a paper clip in it without slipping. I loved it. It was a little on the rough side and my mother always insisted that a little bit of oil would make the curls soft and more defined. I always said no. Sure, we could have used a different type of oil, but my girls were still so young and the allergy process had made me terrified of incorporating new things into their routine. I made sure I explained why to my mom too. She remembered what we had gone through with OD and her allergy. She brought me food and clothes at the hospital more than a few times. She helped me move all of my furniture and clothes out of my house when I was eliminating every possible source of allergen. She taught me how to cook from scratch when I was eliminating certain foods from the kids diet. She knew everything about OD's struggle. To this day, I cannot understand how she did what happened next. November 2nd, 2005. I was giving a midterm that day to my students and I had to be at my research lab late that night. My DH was away at some conference and our nanny was down with the flu so she couldn't watch the kids that day. So I had my mom come take them for the day. My son was almost three years old and the girls were a year and a half old. Overnight visits with my parents weren't exactly common, but they weren't unusual either. They had always come back from these visits very happy and well taken care of, so I had no second thoughts about leaving them with my parents. They spoke to me on the phone after their lunch and then around 5pm we video chatted. The kids were also happy and healthy. I got home around 10.30pm that night and called my mom to see if the kids were up by any chance and I could say goodnight. I missed the kids by about 20 minutes. They had already gone to bed. So I talked to my mom for a little bit but she's a pretty early sleeper too so we hung up and went to bed. I woke up around 5am the next morning to go pick up my husband from the airport at 6. We were going to get breakfast together and then go pick up the kids. I picked up DH and neither one of us was very hungry yet. So we thought it would be a nice treat to pick up the kids first and go to breakfast with my parents. We got to my parents house at 7.45am. My parents weren't there. My son was at the neighbor's house and ran outside with the neighbor as soon as he saw his daddy and I pull up. He was hysterical and crying and I couldn't calm him down. My blood pressure was rising because now I'm thinking that something horrible had happened to my parents. The neighbor tells me that she isn't sure what's happening but there was an ambulance at my parents house at 6am and my dad had run over and woken them up to see if they could watch my son for a few hours until he got back. Of course they said yes. I'm calling my parents non-stop at this point and I'm getting frantic because I don't know what's happened. My son was still crying but he was calmer. He still couldn't really explain to me what had happened though. I honestly don't remember the details of what happened next but somehow we figured out that the ambulance was from X hospital nearby and we broke several driving laws trying to get there. We got to the hospital, pulled into the emergency entrance that was for ambulances only, left the car and bolted inside. A few nurses took notice of us immediately and were asking us what was wrong. I was calmer than my DH at this point so I explained that I didn't know but my twin girls and my parents were here somewhere. I'll never forget the look on that nurse's face. She knew exactly who I was in that moment and she was about to cry. Another nurse took me and my DH to an empty room and asked us to calm down and listen to the doctor before we went to find my family. My mother had put coconut oil in both my daughter's hair when they were playing the previous day before bed. The girls loved it when my mom did 
did their hair and so they had asked for braids and my mom was doing their hair. She put coconut oil in both their hair because it would make for smoother braids. According to my son, OD started to get a little dizzy and itchy when my mom was doing her hair so my mom gave her some kids Benadryl which made her sleepy. Since it was close to bedtime anyways, the kids then went to bed. Giving her Benadryl was something we did whenever she had a mild reaction since it usually meant she accidentally came across some coconut from a secondary source. We also showered her from head to toe immediately to erase any lingering traces of it. My mother simply gave her some Benadryl and kept the coconut oil in her hair and put her to effing sleep. The Benadryl made her sleepy and unable to wake up or be conscious enough to wake up her brother or cry. She vomited in her sleep and the rash spread all over. Her little body was swollen to twice the size. She had asphyxiated in her sleep. She died painfully and slowly in the early hours of the morning. My mother had found her when she went to check on the kids in the morning around 7am. She was already dead by then. My mother screamed, called for my dad, and that's when they had gone to the hospital. My dad hadn't known about the coconut oil until my mom explained it and to this day, I've never seen my father so angry. He was still unable to look at my mother out of fury or me out of shame when I saw him at the hospital. They had rushed to the hospital hoping that there was some way to save my OD and to get my YD checked out immediately since he thought she might have a mild allergy as well. I can't even explain to you the emotions my DH and I felt. I remember seeing my little girl and just being in denial. There was no way that she was gone. This had to be a horrible, horrible nightmare. The following days, the funeral, and explaining to my other kids what had happened are events I still can't talk about because it just breaks a part of me. My mother was investigated as was my entire family. I almost lost my kids to my country's version of CPS once because they thought my kids were in danger. My DH and I had to fight tooth and nail to show that uprooting them during this time would be the worst thing for them at the moment. My mother was never arrested. My father did leave her, though they're not officially divorced. The majority of my mother's family refused to speak to her, and the few that do speak to her only do so on a limited basis. She currently lives on her own in a small town, and every couple months, I'll get a call from her telling me how sorry she is and how she just wasn't thinking and can I please find a way to forgive her. She wants to come see me. The only thing I can find to ever say to her is, you can come see me when you bring my daughter with with you. It's been 13 years. Our son just got his license this year and YD is going to start high school soon. Both of them are healthy and they're turning into amazing adults, but neither one has been the same since OD passed. Our son is extremely protective of YD. YD used to be so bubbly and such a talkative little child, but she's quiet now. When she does speak, it takes some effort to hear her because she's so quiet. She told me a few years ago that she knows she was only a baby when it happened, but she feels incomplete all the time, like a part of her is missing. If it weren't for my DH, I don't think I could have ever recovered from the loss of my daughter. We have helped each other through the loss. It's taken over a decade of therapy to even get to this point. I don't know what I expect to get out of typing all of this out, but I've seen how much comfort this subreddit brings other posters, so hopefully I find some of the same peace. Thank you for reading. This post was created back in 2019 by user PSFI678 on r slash let's not meet. It's titled The Man on My Patio. Warning, long post, but I recommend you read it all. Okay, so this happened when I was around 9 years old, 25 now, and it's something I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I lived in a terraced house, meaning four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There's a small road 10 meters from my yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area with several of those terraced houses spread around in my neighborhood, so seeing people walking on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was 9, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe 50 meters away from my school, so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. 
This one day, I got home from school. I did the usual thing, which was to make sure I locked the front door and double checked that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was 9. Being alone was a little scary, even though it was in the middle of the day and only for one hour. I then rushed to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as possible before my mom came home and made me do homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio, with a view to the road I told you about before. It was kinda like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope sparked and I thought, OMG, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me gives me goosebumps just writing this. There was a guy standing on my patio, a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes, making him look like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high-pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth, and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomped cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this, eventually snapped out of it and screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react, he kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door, and called my mom, who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life. Laying in bed under my sheets, shivering with fear as I hear these creepy high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarette stomps from the ashtray on my patio. I kinda blacked out for a moment because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy, saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we will come down and arrest you, and so on. He didn't respond, but the high-pitched sounds was more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and a woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story under me and out of my field of view. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged a female officer with full force, and he effing knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, screaming still. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer, who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup and an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else because he just looked at me and said, I sure as hell hope you didn't see all that. I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive, wondering what the hell was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the guy with them in the car and left. Before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what had happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around 5 kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house 5 years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time 5 years ago because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tensions in the body because of the autism, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came this day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure this would never happen again. He promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back, until one year ago. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there, looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod and then I hear the high-pitched noises. Holy crap, it's him. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds made me realize. My heart started racing and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. 
I realized that he must have managed to escape again. I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. 16 years later and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did to that police officer. He didn't. He smiled. He looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. We went inside. His face lit up with pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden, he sat down on my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. I realized I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later. We made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week. It makes my heart warm. This final entry isn't exactly disturbing, but it's more so just straight up disgusting. It was created back in August of 2012. The story originated as a comment made on an Ask Reddit post, asking professionals what their most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience was. The thread itself is pretty effed up, and we might take a look at that alone some other day. But the post that went on to be known as the Swamps of Dagobah went like this. OR nurse here. This is kind of a long one. I was taking call one night and woke up at 2 in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time, I lived in a town that had large populations of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Got to the hospital where a few more details awaited me. Pararectal abscess. For the uninitiated, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the asshole, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say, our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ER nurse said as she handed me the chart was, have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314 pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning, so after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get this circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10 minute ride to the OR, nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot though. Chronic users who don't handle pain well and who have used so many substances that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted, tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I'd been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I've watched an 88 year old man tear a 1 inch diameter catheter balloon out of his penis while screaming, you'll never make me talk. I've been attacked by an HIV positive neo-Nazi. I've seen some stuff. The other nurse had been in the OR as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at the level 1 trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army and averaged about 8 words and 2 facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed. A little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart noted that she had been injecting substances in that area. So this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad substances, but overall it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of, oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at that exact moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm, and just like that, all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to us, the infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, 
rotten tissue and fecal matter that has seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mafia. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against a fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room, in easy 7 feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator, not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction, she shot more of this grey-brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into other nurses' shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away, jaw dropped open within my surgical mask, watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon standing on tiptoes to keep this stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh god, I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room, shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me, mouth still wide open, not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't effing breathe. My lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next, an ex-NCAA D1 tailback, his 6 foot 2 frame shaking as he threw open the door to the OR suite in an attempt to get more air in, letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus splashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head. Is this real life? In all operating rooms everywhere in the world, regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is. Everyone knows what it is for. And everyone prays to their gods they never have to use it. In times like this, we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to our central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept, and was greeted by an empty effing box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godless individual who had used the last of the peppermint oil and not replaced a single drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last user I can find, just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I can find, a vial of mastosol which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but considering that over one third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. I started rubbing as much of this as I could get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be smelling anything except whatever slimy demon spawn we had just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dowsing the front of his mask in it so he could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that mastosol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this, but in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our OR suite, and down the 40-foot hallway to the front desk where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery, clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters 2, except dirty. Oh, so dirty. I stepped back into the OR suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on fan forums. Here's this one guy in blue surgical garb, standing nearly ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah, except the swamps had just come out of this woman's butt and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the insides of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. 
The front of his gown was a gruesome mixture of brown and red. His eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helped him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze, taped this woman's rear end closed to hold the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. Turns out, 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes 4 or 5 bottles to get really clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter in two and a half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning, the entire department, a fairly large floor within the hospital, still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all of the fluid and debris left behind. The OR suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen anything, kid. The Sentry was created in r slash ghosts back in January of 2014. It's titled Experience Using Sleep as Android App. I used an app called Sleep as Android to improve my sleep. One of the features is that it records your nighttime noises, snoring, sleep talk, cover ruffles, coughing, etc. I've been using the app since October 1st of 2013. I've never caught anything other than sounds created by me changing positions or coughing or something like that. Although I've been told several times I talk in my sleep by other people. On December 30th at 2.04 AM, I caught something very weird. To set up, this night I was sleeping in my bed. My three-year-old was with me that night as he is scared of the dark. It was just the two of us in the whole house. The next night, I decided to go through and delete my recordings and saw this particular record. In it, you can hear some clicks that start to get louder over the course of the recording. Eventually, you can hear me say, what are you doing? And immediately after, there is a deep voice that says, nothing. The clicks become very loud at that point, and at the very end of the recording, you hear the same voice say, that's them, I think. I am pretty creeped out by this. I don't remember being awake that night. The only plausible explanation is that I answered my own sleep talking, but the voice doesn't even sound like me, or something I could emulate. It definitely doesn't sound like a voice my preschooler could emulate either. I have no idea what the clicks could be. I keep a fan going at night for white noise, but the clicks sound like they're coming from right near my phone, which is placed right by me on my bedside table. I want to say that I've picked up the clicks a few times on recordings before, but deleted them thinking it was nothing. This is the first time I've ever heard anything though. OP went to add additional audio recordings from other sleep sessions for people to compare. Then in the fourth edit, they said the following. This post was linked to r slash creepy. Thanks. And just so there's an update for people wondering how this turned out. I have caught no more voice recordings since then. Also, as suggested by several people, I've beefed up my home security, changed locks, that kind of thing. This happened four months ago. Since then, I have had no more weird voice recordings, but there were one or two more instances of the clicking noise waking me up at night. During one of the times that it woke me up, I sat up and tried to hear where the sound was coming from, even though I was pretty scared. The sound seemed to be coming from the area of my fan, about 12 feet away from my bed, but the closer I got, it started to fade away. When I got to my fan, it wasn't coming from my fan at all that I could tell and it just stopped. Very weird. Also, I took someone else's advice and walked through my house shortly after the final clicking and asked that whatever it was to please leave my house and that my son and I were scared. I felt like a complete ding dong doing that though, but I was up for trying about anything. 
I'd say nothing weird has happened for about 3 months now. I am completely fine with that. This experience really messed with me for a while. Of course, there were many people in the comments that believed that this was just OP mumbling to herself in her sleep. But as time went on and Redditors were given more time to investigate, it seemed that people were in agreement that this was just not the case. One user named Tipper the Clown said the following, I am convinced you are a victim of a home invasion. The ambient noises in the recording are very sinister sounding and by that I mean it sounds like somebody is rummaging through your belongings or perhaps looking for things to steal. They sound quite loud and I'm going to assume that they were more prominent than the clicks you normally hear. This is going to sound somewhat outlandish, surely this is more believable than ghosts however, but I believe this is what might have happened. The intruder entered your room looking for things to steal, and in the process was opening up whatever satchel slash bag they brought with them to pack the things they would steal. This is the clicking noise we hear throughout the video. This is actually very important to my theory, as I'll note later. The noises they made were enough to startle you awake, but not to full consciousness. Since you said that what are you doing is a normal question you would ask when you were with your ex. I believe that you said it out of habit, having not been awake enough to realize what you were doing. This startled the robber, but after seeing that you clearly weren't jumping out of bed to attack them or anything, they must have correctly guessed that you were still asleep, or mostly asleep anyway, and answered with nothing in an attempt to convince you that you were just dreaming, if you happened to be awake enough to hear it. Now here is where the clicking noise is important. I know I am probably sounding crazy here, but I believe this is very important. Note that the clicking noise momentarily pauses immediately after you ask what are you doing is heard once more, then stops again briefly before starting again. That can't be a coincidence, can it? Surely if I was a robber and I was looking around for things to steal, I'd be startled enough by the sound of someone asking what are you doing to stop what I was doing at that moment. I believe if it was a thief, they were getting ready to take things and when you asked what are you doing, they were understandably startled and stopped what they were doing to focus on you. That was the first pause. The second one we hear is them remaining silent to see if you do anything, to see if you are actually awake or still sleeping. Once they determined that you were just sleeping, they continued with what they were doing, which is why the noises picked up again. The second set of clicking noises sounds like clasps being closed, perhaps on some sort of briefcase or satchel. Maybe they decided it wasn't worth the risk, closed their bag up and left? I have a briefcase with clasps and when I close them, they sound exactly like that noise. I mean, I could be wrong, it could be the water bottle, which is a noise that the clicking also resembles a lot, but I'm going based on what you said about it in a response to user Penny Royal. As for the last line, I'm not sure. It could be that's them, but I'm not sure what context a thief would be saying that in. Maybe there was more than one and he said that's them as a way of identifying who the occupants of the home were. Couldn't tell you to be honest. Only thing I could tell you is that in my opinion it couldn't be I'm Jenny or Danny because it sounds like that one flat syllable at the end. I know that probably sounds a bit crazy, but I am someone who is more inclined to believe a theory like that than ghosts, though that might just be because I don't believe in them. Listening to the enhanced audio a few more times, it sounds like after the word nothing, the voice begins to say go b before stopping. Perhaps the intended full sentence might have been something like nothing, go back to bed. Pure speculation on my part. OP made a final edit in April of 2015 that said, No longer living at the house where this took place, so no more updates from here on out. Thank God. OP is still active on Reddit and occasionally comes back to this thread to make comments, but it doesn't seem like they ever figure out just what had happened that night. Was this truly a home invasion? If so, it's definitely scary to think what would have happened if OP was fully conscious. This entry was posted on the r slash confessions subreddit under the account name MESC997 on June 6th, 2019. It's titled, I am responsible for the deaths of several people. Around four years ago, I was a vendor on the dark net. It was a relatively short-lived thing. I was just doing it because I was too lazy to get a job and at the time didn't want to settle for the 9 to 5 thing. I wanted to start my own business and use the money as a startup. 
I had been using myself for years, along with that, I met lots of people into the scene, and eventually started myself. I have a lot of anxiety though, so I hated meeting up with people in parking lots and I definitely didn't want anyone to know where I lived. That's when I read about the Silk Road. I got obsessed with learning, all with the goal of eventually using my connections to start up my store. Well, after a couple of months, I did. I started my store with three items. All was going good for a few months, had a couple thousand get stolen in an exit scam, but I had about $25,000 saved at that point, so it didn't ruin my life like a few vendors I knew of. Eventually, I met a local connect that came into my town only once a week, but he had anything I wanted. I put all my addresses into an Excel spreadsheet along with their name, zip code, order, along with the amount. At the time, I was selling a super white powdered item. The F was also a white powder. Very similar consistency. Long story short, my Excel F'd up or I F'd up, and about 7 people's orders were filled with F orders. They all went out. I didn't notice and kept doing my thing for a few days. After about 5 days, someone contacted me and told me their friend died from one of my orders. I immediately called BS and went to check my order log. Now it turned out I still had the item that this particular person ordered. I still don't know how the F it could have happened. I went to check my order log on the market to see if anyone had finalized on their purchase and a couple of them were, but none from a specific day. No one that had purchased that item that day had finalized their orders. The market I was on also had a feature to see the user's last activity, and none of them had logged in in at least 3 days, most 2 days. I immediately deactivated my vendor account. I didn't even need confirmation, I knew what happened. I knew I just killed several people. I sold the rest of my items, converted my bitcoin to cash, and moved the F away. Didn't speak to anyone for weeks. I found a job in a restaurant, living in a city I always wanted to. I haven't touched that niche since that day. I haven't had anything to do with that life since then. I still think about them, every night. I saved their names and googled them a few days later. I was able to find info on 4 customers that definitely died. One customer shared it with a friend. They both died. I don't know why I'm even posting this, mainly because I have no one to tell and even if I did, I don't think I could. I spend my days sober, clocking into work, clocking out of work, coming home playing video games. I'm a complete recluse. People I used to know have distanced themselves immensely and I know it's because I'm a shell of my former self. I can't help it. Could I even tell a therapist about this? I don't feel like I deserve to be alive. Am I really living anyway? I don't even know anymore. Maybe this will help me feel better. For this entry, a redditor stumbles upon a hidden area within a bridge that is pretty unsettling. The post was made all the way back in May of 2012 and is simply titled The Bridge. This is slash was going to be short, but the memory sprung into my mind a couple days back and I thought it would be worth sharing. I live in North Wales, UK. For anyone who has had the pleasure of visiting, it truly is a beautiful place to live. Though for an adolescent boy, it is certainly lacking in things to do. As a result, my friends and I would often find ourselves mindlessly exploring areas of countryside and coastline. Despite it being quite sparsely populated in comparison to the closest cities, there is a dual carriageway running right along the coast from Wales into England. Also, train tracks run alongside this road for most of its course, occasionally passing overhead via a small cement bridge. Anyway, there was one night a few years ago when about 4 of us randomly decided to try and explore the inside of one of these bridges. As one of the group had observed a manhole cover nearby which we believed to be the entrance. On closer inspection, we discovered that several tools would be required in order to gain entry. We returned with the necessary equipment and proceeded to unbolt the cover. This had to be done stealthily as the train track was right beside us. Not close enough to be of any danger, but definitely a sufficiently small distance to cause panic for any train driver. And panic usually means police. It wasn't long before we had removed the heavy steel disc and had started descending the ladder down into the structure. Once we had all safely reached the bottom, we decided to progress to the other side. 
At this point, we are totally confined into the narrow space that leads into the main area. If you are confused as to what the hell this bridge is supposed to be, you probably should be, because it was rather peculiar. I mean, I would have never known there was even an inside had we not found the manhole. So as we squeeze and crouch and at one point scrape along our bellies to the other side of the structure, there is a growing sense of claustrophobia between us. The distance from one end to the other is surprisingly long, but by the halfway point you can look down through narrow gaps onto the motorway below. This was actually pretty cool, which helped keep us calm in a strange way. At this point, apart from the mild discomfort and confinement, we were still just a group of guys on an adventure. This was about to change dramatically, no more than a few meters beyond halfway, which we could tell due to the symmetry of the passageways through the bridge, one of us claimed that they they could see some object in the distance at the far end. Slightly hesitantly, we agreed to investigate. Bad move. I reached the end first, and let me tell you, I have never felt the same sense of dread before or since. In front of me was a single foldaway chair positioned facing a wall. On the wall was a partially torn page from a newspaper or a magazine showing a fully naked lady in an erotic position. The reason I don't just refer to this as is because something was different about it. I can't put my finger on it, but it seemed more sinister than anything else, if that even makes any sense. More disturbingly, the eyes of the woman on display had been cut from the page, removed with precision, not just hastily ripped off. The scene that lay before us had rendered us completely speechless, and an overpowering sense of panic could be felt collectively. That was when we found the the horrendous, gut-wrenching, blood-drenched Needless to say, we got the F out of there as fast as humanly possible, smashing our knees and shins against the sharp cement edges that lined the path to the ladder by which we had entered. Of course, we were all praying to God that the manhole hadn't been resealed, as it was impossible to tell until you reached the ladder itself. Thankfully, the exit route was clear and we promptly dashed as far away as our legs could carry us. I'm sure this ending comes as a disappointment to some of you reading this, as we luckily never bumped into the twisted individual who sits in that chair, but I must stress how radically out of the norm this was given where I live. The reason I mentioned the population earlier was with purpose. There is easily enough people here to escape the realms of crazy country folk, yet nowhere near enough people to have someone clear lose grip on society without somebody taking notice. For example, there was literally only one homeless man who everyone in the area knew and grew fond of, eventually resulting in a mass gathering at his funeral when he passed away. I sometimes think, though not recently as I had more or less forgotten about that night entirely, about the person who climbs down into that bridge and navigates through the darkness to sit facing a wall and do god knows what that ends up with a full of blood. You honestly couldn't envision a more surreal situation. It has just come to my realization that what we unearthed that night has not once been uttered to another soul. As a naive teenager, it was the type of thing you just wanted to forget, but thinking about it, we probably should have let the police or at least someone know about what was down there, because it wasn't the doings of a healthy-minded individual. So there you have it. Apologies for the length, I got a little carried away as it is my first L&M post and I wanted to make the reading experience as similar to reality as I could. Now that I'm a few years older and hopefully a bit braver, I'm considering going down there again, accompanied of course, to see what exactly might be waiting there. This could well happen in the next couple days and rest assured I will 100% post an update as I currently have no job, so time is plentiful. Thanks for reading. Edits, as promised, here are the photos from the return visit. We went early evening, so there was still plenty of light, and as a result, I have decided to use a simple filter on most of the outdoor shots simply to reduce the light and give it the eeriness it deserves. Unfortunately, I hadn't adequately conveyed my plans to those accompanying me, and they had presumed I just wanted to check out the small area before the entrance to the passageways, as they had been there before. When I expressed my wishes to navigate through the bridge, they instantly noped out of there. As you can imagine, I was massively disappointed. I hope to go back soon with a different bunch of guys, but I can't promise when. 
perhaps if everyone who would like to see the re-return visit just leaves a single comment saying update. I could reply to you individually, so you don't have to keep checking back. Just wait for a message, just a thought. Either way, the pictures are definitely worth your time. Thanks again, guys. Edit 2. The Bridge Revisited here are the pictures taken from last night's return to the bridge. This will be the last time I ventured down there. Thanks for reading. I hope you enjoy. The additional post with the photos from OP said, Early yesterday evening, a friend and I decided to embark on the revisit to this awful place in hope of finding some remnants of the twisted scene that had been stumbled upon several years ago. We were not disappointed. If anything, it was even worse than I had imagined. Aside from what you will see in the photos, the general environment within the bridge structure is practically uninhabitable, as it bloody well should be, and it's stomach turning to say the least. The amount of dust in the passageways is actually quite unbearable, but that is nothing compared to the constant stench that must be endured. Also, the heat didn't help this situation either. I won't ramble on, but I must express how vulnerable you feel when navigating through the tunnels. Even with two of us both carrying appropriate weaponry, the sense of evil was overpowering. The tension is amplified tenfold by the fact that had we encountered someone or something, the layout of the structure and the multiple tight squeezes mean a safe, speedy exit is nigh on impossible. It truly is a hellhole. Without further ado, here is what lies in the bridge. Enjoy. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors, and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM, which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Farts. It also supports the channel, so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now, back to the video. This entry focuses on a Reddit user named rbradbury1920 and was posted in r slash legal advice back in May of 2015. It was titled, Post-it Notes Left in Apartment. On the 15th of April, I found a yellow post-it note in a handwriting that wasn't mine on my desk reminding me of some errands I had to do, but told literally nobody about. While odd, I chalked it up to something I did in my sleep, thinking maybe in my half-awake state, I scrawled it so it didn't appear to be my handwriting. I threw it out and thought little of it. On the 19th, I found another post-it note on the back of my desk chair, in the same handwriting as the previous note, telling me to make sure I saved my documents. I was freaked out, but there were no other signs of a break-in, so I set up a webcam in my house, aimed at my desk, and used a security cam app for it to record after detecting movement. On the 28th, I woke up to find another post-it note, this one saying, Our landlord isn't letting me talk to you, but it's important we do. I immediately checked the webcam's folder on my computer and found nothing from the night before, but my computer's recycling bin had been emptied, which I am certain I did not do recently, indicating someone had noticed the webcam and deleted the files. They were just saved straight to a folder on my desktop called webcam. Today, on the 1st of May, I found another post-it note, this time on the outside of my door with nothing written on it. And there also appeared to be post-its on many other doors in my apartment complex, all blank in varying colors. Do I have any legal recourse here? I have no proof except for the post-its, but those are written by my pen and on my post-it notes, so conceivably, I could have faked them. Would contacting the police get me into any trouble if they can't determine an outside source for this? I just want to make sure I'm not wasting anyone's time. Should I consult my landlord, those also living in the complex? Edits, I pulled up a letter I received from my landlord back when I moved in and the handwriting is identical. Could this count as evidence? As we can see in the comments, a lot of people thought that OP's post was complete BS, but others that took Bradbury a bit more seriously suggested things like adding an additional lock that could only be unlocked from the inside. Another Redditor suggested the possibility that OP was having some health issues. Seeing a doctor should be your priority for two reasons. You could be having a serious mental or neurological problem, and even if you're not, that will probably be the police's first thought. If you have a general practitioner, make an appointment ASAP. 
they'll be able to get the ball rolling and make appropriate referrals. Bring in the notes and the sample of your landlord's handwriting so your doctor can look at them. Another user would make a similar comment, also picking at the idea that perhaps OP is simply losing some memories. User Kakerlak commented, You seem sincere and this doesn't appear to be the plot of a Ray Bradbury short story. It's possible that your landlord is leaving notes inside your apartment, but they don't make any sense in the context you're describing them. It's likely that you are writing the notes yourself, but you are forgetting. Do you use post-it notes as reminders in any other parts of your life or job? Yes, this might be a mental health issue. You might be experiencing some sort of dissociative disorder, or it might be a physical problem. You mentioned that you have a very unusual narrow bedroom with no windows. Is there a chance that you are not getting enough ventilation when you sleep? Or that there is a carbon monoxide leak in the building? A cheap CO detector, which you should have anyway, is a fast way to find out. You'll also have really bad headaches. You know your own medical and mental history and your other experiences. If you think these incidents might be you writing notes to yourself, there's no shame in getting somebody qualified to give you an opinion. User Kakerlak did some digging on R. Bradbury's account and noticed that they made a comment mentioning a compact apartment with no windows. Bradbury was wanting to know how they could fit in both a desk and bed inside this room. This got Kakerlak thinking that perhaps Bradbury was indeed suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. Luckily, Bradbury saw Kakerlak's comments and said the following, I have had really bad headaches, and I actually already do have a CO detector. Guess I should probably take that out of its box and plug it in. And it turned out that OP was indeed suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. This random Reddit user just saved OP's life. This post was created back in July of 2019 by user CrazySonThrowOff in the r slash confession subreddit. Okay, fair warning, this one is long as hell. Apologies for that, but this is very hard for me and I have been carrying it for a lot of years. On the advice of my therapist, I've written it all out to try to work out my feelings on it. He didn't advise me to submit it to Reddit of course, but I have struggled with this for a long time and I need to hear other people's opinion on it. I still really have no idea how I feel about it even after all these years, but I will submit for judgment by the masses. I know I did wrong on some things, probably a lot of things. I tried to do the best that I could. My son was very troubled. Very troubled. If you have seen the movie We Need to Talk About Kevin, it will really help to understand what I'm talking about. Because I swear to god, when I watched that film, I thought I was watching a documentary on my life. I felt like the writer must have had cameras hidden in my house. That's how accurate it was. The only difference is that in the movie, the boy appears normal to his father and only reveals his true nature to his mother. With my son, he didn't have that mask. His insane behavior was the same with everyone. From from the day he was born, my son just came out wrong. He was planned. My wife and I tried to get pregnant and were ecstatic when he was born. He was wanted and loved. We showered affection on him and really tried to give him a happy childhood. But from the day we brought him home from the hospital, he was miserable. He cried for 13 months straight. I'm not exaggerating, 13 months without a break. He cried until he had no voice left and kept crying. You could see his little face scrunched up and no sound coming out. Totally hoarse. There were times he would literally be crying in his sleep. I've never seen or heard of any other kid able to do that. We brought him to doctors, specialists, tried changing his diet, held him, rocked him, toys, swaddling, music, mobiles, everything we could think of. Nothing worked. 13 months of grading, grinding, no sleep hell. Once he got over the crying stage, we thought we were out of the woods. But it quickly became clear that for some unknown reason, he was just angry at being alive. I never saw that kid have a genuine joyous smile once in the time I knew him. I saw him grin a vicious, horrible grin many times, taking a perverse pleasure from causing pain or suffering or breaking a rule. But a smile from real pleasure at something nice? No. 
Never. Not once. He had no interest in anything positive. He was fueled by hate, and everything he did was bent toward that. As soon as he could walk, his mission in life was to destroy things. He would break or try to break anything that came in his range. Smash it, chew it, throw it in the toilet, whatever he could. After a while, he figured out how to get his diaper off and took great pleasure in a and peeing anywhere he could. After a while, he figured out he could hide it and started doing the same thing in places we couldn't find right away, grinding it into carpets, making it even more of a problem to clean, and making the house stink. When he got older, aged around 9 to 15, he would do the same thing in our bed, until we got a lock on our door and he wasn't able to get in anymore. Then he'd just take a dump in the hallway in front of our room. That biological warfare started at around two and a half years old, and he never grew out of it. I'll try to speed it up as I could literally go on for days about this stuff, but as he grew older, he became more and more unmanageable. He would bite, kick, scream, scratch, and spit at anyone trying to do anything with him. He was kicked out of school twice before he was nine. Then they let him back in, and then kicked him out for good. He had to change schools. The next one put him in a special class that kept him away from the other students. We had to install a door and lock on the kitchen because he would steal knives and chase people with them. When he was 10, he got me in my hip and butt. I still have the scars. As he grew older, he grew darker. He moved into setting things on fire and hurting local animals. There was a stray dog that hung out around the park near our house. My son blinded it in one eye with a barbecue fork. He became a violent, stinking, vicious beast that lived in our house. We couldn't do anything with him. I will take this opportunity to preempt the tsunami of messages. Yes, we had the kid in therapy. He saw a psychiatrist twice a week and had God knows how many different medications prescribed to him over the years. Nothing worked. Therapy didn't work. Meds didn't work. Nothing effing worked. He was like a poison cloud of hate and fury lashing out at anything in his reach. When my son was 16, my wife got pregnant again. I can't tell you how different our reaction was. Instead of joy, we felt horror. This pregnancy had not been planned and we really were at a loss over what to do. My son had been such an unending nightmare for 16 years. We couldn't take the idea of starting again from the beginning. We talked a lot about our options, but in the end, we decided that my wife would have the baby, and if it turned out evil, we would put it up for adoption. We knew we just couldn't do it again with another child like our son. We had a daughter. She was normal. Suddenly, we saw what our lives should have been like the whole time. How things would have been had our son not been himself. She laughed at things. She breastfed without biting. She didn't have teeth yet anyway, but you could tell she was just trying to eat. After four months, she was sleeping through the night. She was happy. She was normal. I can't describe the relief and happiness that we both felt. I don't have words for it. This is where I believe I may have started really pulling back from my son. Up until that time, whatever mistakes I made, I had always tried to do the best for my son. I am convinced of that. I tried to help him and love him and care for him. I really tried. But when my daughter was born, my wife and I both instinctively just turned toward her. She became our focus, not from malice, but just because she was so much easier. She was so happy and sweet. Every moment we were with her was like magic. I understand this was wrong, but we honestly couldn't help it. I don't have a better explanation than that. My son hadn't given a crap about my wife being pregnant. I honestly don't know if he really understood it. But when we brought our daughter home, he started acting out even more. I didn't think it was possible, but he took it up another notch. At this point, he was 17 and we were having full-blown screaming matches daily. Usually after we fought, he would storm out of the house and disappear for hours at a time or come back the next morning. It was a relief. I started to actually look forward to our fights because it would get him away from us for a while. After the birth of our daughter, my relationship with my son was almost entirely gone. Our only real interactions were screaming at each other. My wife was even worse with him. She just had nothing left. By that time, if our son even came into the same room as her, she would just stop whatever she was doing and start screaming, get the F away from me, get away, get the F out, until he left. 
He started spending more and more time out of the house, which was a blessing for us. I have no idea what he got up to out in the world, but we were just happy it wasn't being inflicted on us. As a consequence of our son's behavior, we had invested heavily in locks around our house. All of the cheap, thin interior doors in our home had been replaced with thick, dense wooden doors that couldn't be kicked through, equipped with keyed locks that my wife and I carried keys to. I know it sounds extreme, but locks and heavy doors were the best way we had found to create safe spaces from him. And again, before I am inundated with messages, I was not locking my son in rooms like a prisoner. He had free reign of the house and could come and go as he pleased. My wife and I would lock ourselves in rooms to protect ourselves from him. If anything, we were the prisoners in our own home. On the day in question, I had fought with my son in the morning and he had left the house in a rage. My wife and I were enjoying some peace and quiet in the kitchen while our daughter napped in our bedroom. And then my daughter began crying. Any parent who has young children can tell you you get used to your child's cries and you can tell after a while what they need. They cry differently if they are hungry or need changing or are just restless and want to be held. Babies can communicate pretty well before they can speak. This cry was none of those things. This cry was terror. The second we heard it, my wife and I were both up out of our chairs and running to the room. The door was locked of course, and it took a few seconds to get the right key and get it open. My son was in the room. We lived in a bungalow and the guy had climbed in the window to get her. He was standing over her crib with a steak knife in his hand. I have no idea where he got it. It wasn't one of ours. We controlled our knives very carefully and always kept them in locked drawers. I think he may have stolen it from one of our neighbor's houses. He had broken her skin twice already. I could see blood running down. When I entered the room, he was teasing her with it while she screamed. He looked up at us and smiled. Before I knew what I was doing, I was already moving, running to put myself between them. I didn't think about it, I just moved instinctively. Even with that, my wife got there faster. It was like a movie on fast forward. She got to our son and bashed his hand away, knocking the knife across the room and then shoved him with her whole body weight, so hard that he flew away from the crib and bounced off the wall. I picked up my daughter and held her while my wife screened us. I could see her shaking, almost convulsing. I could remember the smell of the room, the sound of my daughter screaming and wailing, the look on my son's face as he stood there. Just nothing. Blank. Dead. There was nothing in his eyes. No emotion. He looked like an alien to me. I watched my wife take a step toward him. I could have reached out and stopped her, but I didn't. She stepped forward again, getting very close to him. I could have stopped her again, but I didn't. She waited, looking at him for maybe 3-5 to five seconds without moving. And then she punched him in the face. Now, until this point, you may have been picturing my wife as a typical woman, small frame, dainty, delicate. This is not the case. My wife does have a small frame, but dainty and delicate she is not. Never has been since I've known her. Since her early teens, my wife has been a boxer. MMA didn't exist back then, but karate and boxing were big in those days, and my wife was a very talented amateur. She was about 130 pounds. She carried a lot of muscle and she knew how to punch. I had 70 pounds on her back then, and I have no doubt that in a real fight between me and her, she could have and would have pounded me flat. Neither of us had ever laid a hand on our son in anger before, but something broke in her that day and all the years of anger and pain and sorrow and frustration just came pouring out. When she hit him, blood started coming out of his nose. He hardly reacted. He just looked at her with this shocked expression like he didn't know how to process what had just happened. She waited another second and hit him again. I could have reached out and stopped her. I could have dragged her out of the room, taken her away, calmed her. I didn't. I just stood there and watched while she systematically started to pound him to a pulp. Every time he brought his hands up to cover one part, she would blast him somewhere else. He started screaming, crying out, yelling for her to stop. It's the most genuine reaction I'd ever seen him have to anything in his whole life. But she wasn't stopping. He tried to swing at her and she slipped him easily. She was on autopilot, sinking down into her training. I stood there watching for a minute. Then I turned my back on them and took my daughter out of the room. I brought my daughter to the kitchen and gave her a bath in the sink. I found that she had cut her a third time on the sole of her foot. All the cuts were superficial. I cleaned her up and held her until she calmed. 
In our bedroom, I could hear my son screaming, calling my wife horrible names, telling her he would kill her and F her corpse. After a while, I didn't hear him saying anything anymore, didn't even hear him crying out. I assumed that he must have been knocked out, but I could still hear her beating him. That went on for a long time, long enough for my daughter to drift off to sleep in my arms. I just sat at the kitchen table waiting for her to finish. Finally, she came out and sat down across from me. Her hands were swollen and red. Her face and arms were splattered with blood. Her chest was heaving. We just stared at each other without saying anything. After a while, I asked her, is he dead? She looked back at me and answered, I effing hope so. I nodded. That was all there was to say about that. I understood how she felt perfectly. I felt the same. I didn't know what to do, so we just sat there waiting silently. Eventually, my wife started crying and went to go take a shower. I just stayed where I was holding our daughter. After a long while, I heard moaning and sobbing coming from our room. It turned out my son was still alive. I went in to see how bad it was, and it was pretty bad. He was lying on the floor in his own blood and vomit, and his face just had immense damage all over it. I could see that a couple of his fingers were bent at weird angles, and he had pissed his pants. When my wife came out of the shower, I still didn't know what to do about our son. I didn't know whether to call the police or an ambulance, take him to the hospital myself. I honestly didn't have any idea what to do. After a while, I realized that I simply didn't care what happened to him anymore and we decided to just let him live on his own. There was an in-law suite in the basement that we had never really used, and my wife, my daughter, and I just moved down there. We simply ceded the top floor of the house to my son and locked everything down, separated our lives entirely. There was plenty of food in the upstairs cabinets, enough for a couple weeks or more. He had a washroom and bedrooms to use. We had a washroom in the basement, a small kitchenette, and a separate entrance so we just stopped going upstairs. We just decided we were done with him. I figured we let his food run out and see what happened. Over the next week, we could hear him moving around upstairs sometimes. I think he just spent most of the time lying in bed recovering. I went to work watching on high alert in case he attacked me in the driveway, but he never did. My wife stayed home with our daughter. She was never out of our sight. One night, we heard him going ballistic, smashing things and banging. We didn't respond. He never tried to get downstairs or get near us though. I think he was afraid that if he got near us again, my wife might finish the job on him. After three weeks in the basement, we hadn't heard anything from up above for a few days, and I ventured upstairs to the main floor of the house. The place was demolished and there was no sign of my son. He was gone. It took him months to repair the damage he had done and get the main floor back to normal again. There was food and crap smeared all over the walls and broken glass on the floor. Big holes in the drywall. He had ripped the place apart. He tore up the linoleum in a corner of the kitchen and emptied an entire foam fire extinguisher into the living room. I feel thankful that he didn't burn the house down with us in it. I'm honestly not sure why he didn't. The kid wasn't shy about lighting things on fire. After that, I lived in fear every day that he would come back, that he would ambush us out of the blue and try to kill us. We've moved houses about three years later, and I finally stopped being afraid that he would show up again, as now he had no idea where we were. I finally felt safe from him. All this happened a long time ago. My son was born in the spring of 1971. My daughter was born in 1988. I'm an old man now. I'll be 70 this year and my wife passed from cancer in 2016. My daughter is 31 now. I moved in with her and her husband after my wife passed. I've got two granddaughters and they are the joy of my life. I see a therapist a couple of times a month to talk about all this. I don't know where my son is. The last time I saw him was when he was lying on the floor of our bedroom, bleeding and smashed. I haven't heard from him since he left. More than 30 years now. I don't want to. I carry a lot of guilt from that time and a lot of conflicted emotions. I didn't hurt him myself, but I was happy it happened. I didn't try to kill him, but I would have been happy if he died. I will say that I do hope he was able to overcome his demons and go live a normal life somewhere. If he wasn't able to do that, if he stayed the way he was, then I truly do hope someone out there ended him. When I knew him, he was a rabid dog, and whichever way it went, I just hope he isn't still out there hurting anyone else.
So for this final entry, think of it as more of a heartwarming post. I think from here on out, after listening to so many messed up entries, I'll include one at the very end that isn't actually part of the official iceberg as a sort of palate cleanser. This one was created by user Otter the Great back in 2018 and is titled, I used to pay my middle school bully not to bully me, then I found out he actually needed the money. He made my life a living hell. He would turn all the boys in class against me and bully me about my eyebrows. One time, he begged me to buy him pizza and said he promises not to bully me all week if I do. So I bought him a box of pizza and he fulfilled his promise. I loved the idea. I began to do it on a regular basis. I started asking him every Friday what he wants next week so that the bullying doesn't happen again. He asked for two bags of hot fries, which is a potato chip flavor here in the US. And another time, he wanted some milk from the cafeteria. And once, he asked for colored pencils for art class. My school had a uniform dress code. It was $25 per shirt and the pants were $15, if I remember correctly. He showed up the first day of 8th grade in regular clothes, a tee and jeans. So he got sent to the main office to wait for his parents. My aunt was there because she used to drop off my lunch and hand me money to buy food after school. She saw him upset and asked what's wrong and he starts crying lightly. His parents wouldn't come because they couldn't afford the uniform and decided it would be best to avoid the situation entirely. After my aunt hands me my lunch, she buys him a uniform hoodie, a couple of tees, and a long sleeve. He said he had pants at home and he was hesitant to accept, but eventually took them and thanked her. Now, 13 years later, he runs a nonprofit that has something to do with kids receiving books. I think it's sweet, and I forgive him for being a bully because he didn't grow up to be an a-hole like most bullies. This entry refers to a Reddit user named fstopvox, who started a subreddit called r slash fstopfitzgerald with a description that said, a repository for all my recordings. The subreddit accumulated over 5,000 members at its peak, but was eventually shut down. But for what reason, you may ask? Well, that's because fstopvox was using it to share inappropriate content involving minors. To make matters worse, this content was created by himself. F Stop Vox was revealed to be a man named Richard Burdett who was 55 years old at the time of his arrest. On April 20th, 2022, the Toronto Police Service Child Exploitation Team executed a search warrant issued towards Richard. He was charged with child luring, making child possessing it, accessing it, and making it. The subreddit was said to have contained explicit scripted content. To add, Richard was actually a high school drama teacher who had sent out well over 1,000 sexually charged messages to a single female student at the school. To my knowledge, I don't think he actually got serious prison time. This post was created on April 25th, 2019 in the r slash let's not meet subreddit by user Enormous Radio. It's titled The Tooth Man. When I was about 6 years old, around 2004, my mom started taking my sister and I to Dr. Daniel's pediatric dental office. The dental center was located inside a giant yellow mansion that also doubled as Dr. Daniel's house. It was honestly gorgeous. When I first started going to the dentist, I was extremely shy and actually suffered from some selective mutism and had a lot of autistic-like tendencies. Needless to say, I relied heavily on my mother's comfort and for someone to give me a voice because it was extremely anxiety-inducing for me to talk to strangers, especially men, for some reason. When my sister and I got called in from the waiting room, my mom followed us to the office until she was told by Dr. Daniels that parents were not allowed to be with their children as it taught kids independence to which my mom complied to. Once in there, he immediately separated my sister and I and in reaction to that I cried because I felt so scared. Dr. Daniels did not like crying so he grabbed me and put his hands over my mouth and nose. He shook me and aggressively warned me that if I continued to cry and scare the other kids that he would make my situation a lot worse. Obviously this scared me even more so I started to cry again. Dr. Daniels had enough and took me into his house part of the dentist office where he screamed at me again. Grabbed me by the neck and shoved me. His hygienist, Judy, came over and told me that if I continued to cry, she would spank me so hard I wouldn't know what had hit me. 
Afterwards, he gave me a juice concoction and left me alone in his house for about 5 minutes until he took me back into the dental office and did work on my teeth. I guess I just instinctively knew that if I wanted to survive, I just had to act like I was not terrified and hold on the tears. All I wanted was my mommy. After the first appointment, my sister and I told my mom that we were scared of the dentist and that he was a mean man, but she just took it as me being an anxious child, so we continued to see him. Each visit was just as terrifying. Every time we pulled into the mansion, my heart just melted away inside my chest. I was so scared. It was no longer pretty to look at. Every time we went to the dentist, Dr. Daniels, or the tooth man as he called himself, always had us have heavy dental work procedures done. We had seals done on several baby teeth and plenty of teeth removed, some with his fingers with no regards to pain level at all. And often when having a tooth removal or seals done, your mouth had to be opened up with a retractor. He would leave us there with the retractor on for about 45 minutes or so before he came to work on our teeth. Sometimes he would eat his lunch while we sat there with our mouth open. Probably one of the worst pains I have ever felt in my life. I remember one time when I was about in third grade, I had been leaned down in the chair waiting with the retractor on for an hour. I was in so much pain I couldn't take it. I sat up on the chair and tried to scream and cry as loud as I could. Dr. Daniels came rushing over angry as could be, took my retractors off and then took me back into his house part again where he screamed at me for being a big baby and scaring all the other kids. I was so sad in myself because I hadn't cried in so long. He then took me back to the dental chair and then pinned me down to my seat in a straight jacket. He put my retractors back on and said that I would have to wait longer because I caused such a scene. All I could do was shed silent tears and drool everywhere and I couldn't even wipe it because he locked up my arm. Arms. Afterwards, my mouth would become so swollen and filled with rashes. It hurt to talk for days. It would leave bruises and swells as soon as I left his chair. He would often tell my mother I was a difficult patient, if I so much as winced at his torture. Once he removed six of my teeth at once and I could barely eat. While he ripped out teeth, he would often sing songs. It was so Sweeney Todd-like. When I was in seventh grade, I started getting some new braces and we started seeing an orthodontist. Not long after that, we we stopped seeing Dr. Daniels and started seeing a new dentist who was actually nice. I had never known that getting your teeth cleaned didn't have to feel like going through a saw trap. I think my mom took us out of Dr. Daniels practice when the orthodontist looked at our dental records and saw a lot of unnecessary procedures being done on our mouths. Not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about our childhood fears and instantly my mind went to the tooth man. Curious, I googled him to see what had happened to him and to my happiness, the practice was shut down. Also left under his name was a Yelp page that was still left up. The page was filled with numerous one-star reviews from former patients that were once abused as kids in his office using the page as an outlet to express their trauma. I started to cry because their experiences were so close and some identical as to what I had went through when I was a kid. It was so sad but at the same time really validating to know that I was not alone. A lot of the procedures we went through were just a scam for him to collect money off our parents' insurance. And now that I think about it, he probably was so adamant on us not crying and screaming for help because he didn't want parents to hear and come and see what was going on. I shake thinking about this. I really pray that he hasn't opened up another practice somewhere else. I know it's hard not to blame parents in this situation, but the truth is this man was a swift abuser. For every injury we had, he would have dental explanations that would make the parents feel stupid for asking. He was an authority figure. I don't blame my mom for not believing us. She knew he was firm, but probably thought we were confusing firmness with meanness. To be honest, even writing this, the torture was so wild it actually sounds made up. She eventually did come around. She's not alone as there were hundreds and hundreds of parents that were duped and deceived by him. To any parent reading this, if you are ever told to not go in with your child to an appointment, something's really not right. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM, which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Fart. It also supports the channel, so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now back to the video.
This post was created three years ago in February of 2021 by user MagnetLink5824 in the r slash confessions subreddit. It's titled, I was kidnapped when I was eight and held in captivity for three years. 26. Female. I was picked up by a stranger from school posing to be my dad's friend, saying that he would drop me off to the airport to catch a flight with my dad. Not only did I actually have to travel with my dad that day, but this man somehow knew my dad was getting off early from work, he told me that morning, and he had to go fishing with his friend. He told me that my dad sent him to pick me up and meet him directly at the airport. I believed him and convinced my teachers that I knew him, because I was excited to go to the airport and left with him. I was held in captivity for three years. I was beaten, starved. 11 year old me had learned to make him trust me. It started with us going around in his car, although I had to sit in the back seat and stay quiet the whole time. He let me come into his kitchen and make food for myself. He let me clean his house. The day we went to feed the ducks at the park, I ran. I ran as fast as my weak legs could carry me. Because of the crowd, I think he lost me. I begged a family for help, telling them I was kidnapped and I wanted to go home. I told them my name, my school's name, and my parents' names. Long story short, they caught him and he committed I was back with my dad, my sisters, my dogs. I am now happily married to my wife of four years, still undergoing therapy, have a good job, and a baby on the way. Edits, I'm very sorry for the last line. I realize it doesn't end well for most and I got lucky, but the only way I kept going was telling myself I'm going to escape and then I'm going to get better. I'm going to love myself again. I'm going to get past my trauma. Since this worked for me, I assumed saying it will end well would work for other people too. Of course, it it wasn't right though. A user named Silver96 took to the comments with a few questions after the post went live to learn more. I can't imagine what you went through and I'm glad to hear you are doing well. If you don't mind answering, have you tried many times to run? Were you living in the same city or he moved you? What happened when you saw your family? OP did see the comments and replied with the following. I wasn't let out for what felt like an eternity, so no, I didn't try to run. I had no idea where I even was. When I saw my family, it was all hugs and kisses and loud sobbing and wailing. I wasn't allowed to go home from the hospital for a few days since they had to make sure I was healthy first. But once I did go home, I realized how much I had missed out on. It wasn't easy. I had terrible PTSD and it felt like everyone tiptoed around me. Therapy really helped all of us. This post was made two months ago in the r slash rbi subreddit by user deflemon. It's titled, My friend went missing in June 2020. His skeletal remains were found one year later. Police never told his family he had called 911 and stated his location. We would have gone there to find him. He could have still been alive. My friend, Kyle Donovan, went missing in June 2020. A missing persons report was filed the next day in the city of his residence, Olathe, Kansas. A little over over a year later, his remains were found by a KDOT employee. Because of COVID, DNA identification was behind. Though the officers told his family that based on the items found, they were 90% sure it was him. At that time, the police also informed his mother that he had placed a 3 minute 911 call the night he went missing. He clearly states his location, but they never went to look for him. They didn't cross reference the missing persons report with the unresolved 911 call so that they could have given his mother his actual location. We searched on foot and with a drone for him where he had told his brother where he was prior to his 911 call. That place, a bridge over the Kansas River, is within seeing distance of his final resting place. We were so focused on the river because that's where he said he was when he talked to his brother earlier. They even threw an 80 pound feed bag off the bridge to watch which direction it went. If KCPD had told us about the 911 call when the missing persons report was filed, we could have gone directly to him. Him. He could have still been alive. Here is a link to a video with portions of the 911 call. It took 8 months from the time of his body's discovery to finally get the positive DNA results, but the medical investigator ruled his cause of death as inconclusive, even though he clearly states, they are trying to kill me in the audio. Something is just so wrong about this. I don't understand how this happened. The police won't give his family any more information because it's an ongoing case, but not a murder investigation. So 
So why the secrecy? It would be extremely helpful to hear any theories or even similar cases from the area. He went missing in Kansas City, Kansas, and his missing persons report was filed in Olathe, Kansas. You may come across some information about him possibly having schizophrenia. Kyle had a highly stressful job, was in a volatile relationship, and had a past history of substance use. Kyle's mom tried to give every bit of information she could when filing the missing persons report, but deeply regrets ever mentioning that he may have had mental health issues. He experienced a bout of psychosis years prior that may have been a substance, alcohol, stress related. His mom blames herself for possibly creating a bias against him and thinks his case may not have been prioritized due to her statements. Please feel free to Google his name, Kyle Chase Donovan, for more information. Sherry Honeycutt with Fox 4 Kansas City has been a great advocate for him and there are several stories slash videos she has produced with good info too. Thank you. Update, I have published a full 911 call to YouTube for you all and removed the personal information it contained. Now, the phone call does run for a decent length, 4 minutes in total, so I will only be playing part of it, but I will link the call in the comments if you would like to listen to all of it. Obviously, Kyle Donovan is in distress here and asks for help from police. After about three minutes, the call is cut. Dispatch was unable to get in touch with Kyle, and whenever they called his phone, it would go straight to voicemail. OP continued with the post, saying, I really, truly believe someone else was nearby Kyle during the call, and I truly believe I can hear that person say, what you gonna do? Then Kyle apologizes. It is my theory that he was injured and hiding from someone when calling 911. He doesn't say that he's hurt, but he says they tried and tried to kill him. I think he's in shock and trying to stay quiet, but also trying to get the point across that he's in serious need of help, which is why I believe he is being so polite and respectful. Additionally, this all took place right as the BLM and the defund the police movements were heating up. Kansas City was a hot spot for protests and some rioting. One theory is the dispatcher could have believed Kyle was trying to lure police to a secluded spot to ambush. Anyway, I I have been trying to answer questions as I have time. I want you all to know how much everyone's comments have meant to me and Kyle's mom. I sent her the link to this thread, so she's here now following along. You all have no idea how much your words have renewed a sense of hope in us. Thank you so much. Additionally, I have been reaching out to private investigation firms today, and once I have an idea on costs, I will be doing some fundraising for Kyle's family. I likely won't be able to post a link here, but you can check my profile for info if you would like to help. Kyle's family Family was not given access to the Victims of Violent Crimes Fund in our state because his cause of death was ruled inconclusive with no pending murder investigation. Thank you all again. Our next post was created pretty recently in early March of this year. It's titled, Don't Hook Up With The Waiter, and was created by user Rapline Please. Sorry in advance, I was drunk most of the time during what happened, so I don't remember every detail. When I was 18 and freshly broken up with my way older boyfriend, I basically went crazy with dating guys. At the time, I also dressed very goth, even going as far as to wear a real corset and trench coat, mostly just enjoying the attention. When one particular afternoon, my friend slash roommate at the time decided to eat at a local Japanese restaurant with both of us all dressed up. Our waiter was a mediocre skinny white guy who clearly was a little alternative but it was hard to tell really with the uniform. We joked about me leaving my phone number on the receipt or something so I hyped myself up and did so. Late that night, he had sent me a text. We talked for a few days, never really having a right time to meet up as I worked 40 minutes away from where I lived. He mentioned the boots he wore meant a lot to him and some other odd things that just seemed like edgy jokes. One really late night coming home, I was texting and driving as any 18 year old does and we decided to meet up. My stupid self invited him over to my apartment where it was just me and the roommate who had been with me before. Our other two roommates were not home. At first it was fine because I was already drunk so I would just let him rant about whatever he wanted. He went on about his life, going to jail, medical bills, his parents, etc. Eventually, he asked me if I wanted to see his tattoos and I was like, okay. He lifted up his shirt and not only could I see the handgun tucked in his waistband, but also his multiple badly covered up 
the tattoos. One was even just slightly covered with a banana. I don't know what it was, but I simply decided the best way to deal with this situation was to appease him, so I went along with it casually. I don't remember exactly every detail because it was over two years ago and I was drunk, but he ended up pulling his gun out at me, asking if I was scared. I was immensely confused and tried to call his bluff, saying I wasn't, which got him to put it away for a while. When we went to hook up in my messy room, he pulled it on me again, saying he wanted to do it with it out. I got mad and tried to fight him off of me and get it away from my head. Of course, I wasn't as strong as him and he hit me in the arm with it, which hurt cause it was a nice one. When I finally got him off of me and he realized I was pissed, not scared, he started acting like a maniac, saying I was crazy for not caring about him pulling a gun on me. He ran off, jumping the fence of the apartment complex and not even taking his car that he came in. In the morning, his car was gone and I had a large bruise from where he had hit me. While to me it is a funny story, I now realize how bad it could have ended up. One user in the comments suggested that the waiter may have been trying to fulfill some roleplay and since OP didn't seem to be scared, the waiter got bored and angry at her. This entry was made in the Mr. Cruel subreddit three years ago in June 2021, and on the off chance that you are not aware of Mr. Cruel, he's an unknown and murderer with four confirmed child victims. I made a vid about him about a week ago, so if you would like more details, you can check that out. I'll link it in the description. Anyway, as the title suggests, user Corrupted believes that they may have grown up with Mr. Cruel raising them. I am the OP of this post, and originally it had been posted in r slash unsolved mysteries, but it was suggested that I post it here as there may be someone out there who could possibly alleviate some of my concerns concerns, or if not, then possibly put me in touch with someone who could help me share this information with the correct authorities. Hi fellow Redditors, not too sure if this is even where I should be or even if I should be posting this. It's been on my mind for many decades now, at least 30 plus years, and it has always terrified me. Although I have no definitive evidence, the coincidences are just too much. To start with, I am only mentioning all of this because I know it's anonymous, and if it wasn't, then there is no way I would even consider mentioning any of this in a public forum. I grew up in an extremely abusive household. My mother displays narcissistic personality disorder, my stepfather is a p and his oldest son is an alcoholic, a compulsive liar, and is also a p Sadly, I know this from first-hand experience and also know that I am not the only person that was affected by them. My mother did nothing about the situation, in fact, she often deliberately put me in compromising positions, leaving me in their custody or turning a blind eye when she had undeniable evidence that something had occurred. When I was about 11 years old, I lived in the state of Tasmania in Australia. My eldest stepbrother had moved interstate to Victoria to join the army, and I was just relieved for the break from his presence. When he completed his basic training, my stepfather and my mother went for a trip to Victoria to watch my stepbrother march out, which is a ceremony at the end of their training to signify that they were now full serving members of the defense force. They were gone interstate for approximately a two week period. My dates are not 100% accurate, but they were gone from about late August to somewhere mid September. I remember this clearly because once they came back to Tasmania, they had nothing but praise about mainland Australia. Australia. Tasmania is an island state, and they wanted to move there. We were packed and ready to move very fast, and were gone in just over two weeks after their return. We arrived in Melbourne on the 5th of October 1987. Not long after we moved to Melbourne, there was an awful case on the news about a man who was abducting young girls from their homes and abusing them. One of his last victims that I was aware of was a young girl named Carmen Chan. Although I was so young at the time and often ignored what Whatever stories were on the news at night time, this stuck with me because we often ate dinner with the television on at the same time. Whenever something came on the news about Carmen Chan and the abductor that the media had dubbed Mr. Cruel, my stepfather would snap at me and insist that I shut up and keep quiet while he listened. He would turn the television up louder and became very focused on whatever the news was reporting. Mr. Cruel had abducted a few girls leading up to this point, and had mostly just assaulted them before he left them somewhere 
where they would be discovered and returned to their families. In Carmen Chan's case, however, she was never returned and eventually was found deceased. My stepfather's abnormally intense interest in the news surrounding these cases always confused me, as he most certainly did not concern himself with my welfare, and there was plenty of violent news on television for him to absorb, so I had no idea why he was so interested in Mr. Cruel. He did have some other peculiar interests, as he used to own a collection of booklets printed about serial killers in our home library. I did not read them all, as I was too young, and really had no interest in the subject at the time, but I remember a book about Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy, etc. Of course, this is not illegal to possess and, on its own, not entirely suspicious, but if you combine it with the rest of my post, then perhaps it will appear to be a little dubious? Anyway, it wasn't until I was much, much older that I started to question as to why my stepfather seemed so interested in Mr. Cruel at the time. That's when I started to read up on what little information the police had on the criminal slash murderer. They believed that he was in the defense force, I think because of the way he was so clean and left behind no evidence or minimal evidence. At the time of these abductions and murders, my stepbrother was in the army, but my stepfather was also a manic neat freak. He would make me wash the hubcaps of the car with a toothbrush when I was cleaning the car, and one day he even went on a meltdown because I left a tiny ink mark on the front page of a newspaper while I was checking to see if a pen was working. His tidiness was a compulsion. The one piece of physical evidence that apparently Mr. Cruel left behind was a whisker, so the police thought that they were looking for a redhead because the whisker was red. Both my stepfather and my brother are brunettes, unless they grow facial hair. They both have red facial hair. The police also thought that their suspect was from either Tasmania or New Zealand, due to some colloquial language that the abducted girls heard. I cannot recall the exact phrase that was released to the media, I just know that when I read it at the time, I recognized it as something that my stepfather and stepbrother used. They often use colloquialism such as, how do you like them apples, or how does that grab you, in a sadistic, condescending tone. This is just a couple of the many they used. Also, at the time of the abductions and murders, all of all of the victims were female and all of them were the same age as myself. Lastly, the last coincidence that comes to mind at the moment is the timeline. From what I read in the media, they believe that the first abductions from Mr. Cruel occurred sometime in either late August to mid-September 1987. I cannot recall the exact date. I just remember how ill it made me feel to know that both my stepfather and my stepbrother were both in Victoria at the time this happened, and the last victim they believe Mr. Cruel abducted was either in September or very early October in 1992. These dates are important because against my wishes and against my stepfather's wishes, my mother insisted we move back to Tasmania and we left Victoria on October the 5th, 1992, just after Mr. Cruel's last apparent abduction before he went quiet in Victoria. Around the same time that we moved back to Tasmania, my stepbrother moved from Victoria to Queensland. So now, both my stepbrother and stepfather were no longer in Victoria, although both of them had been there during the times that Mr. Cruel was active. Both my stepfather and my stepbrother had a sadistic streak, and I honestly believe that after living with them for 13 years, that either one of them was quite capable of doing those acts. My stepbrother was, however, a little skittish and anxious, but my stepfather always kept his composure. At the times that Mr. Cruel was active, we lived in the northern suburbs of of Melbourne, which is where Carmen Chan's body was found, and so did my stepbrother. Her body was found only a couple of suburbs away from where we resided. My stepfather does not appear to fit the physical description of Mr. Cruel as he is quite short, but my stepbrother does. It would not even surprise me if they acted, if it was them, as a pair, because each of them knew of the other's fetish slash sadistic behaviors, and each of them covered for each other. At the time that Mr. Cruel was active, I would also like like to note that at least one of his victims stated that they could hear airplanes overhead when they were abducted. We lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne at the time, not too far from an international airport, and underneath the flight path of many of the flights. Also, one of the descriptions of a room that one of the girls was kept in matches up with what I can remember from one of my stepbrother's rooms when he was living out of our home for a while. My stepbrother never lived on barracks when we moved to Melbourne. He either rented his own place or he moved back in with us for a while. The only time I recall that he lived on a base was just before we moved back to Tasmania.
Tasmania. At this time, he was married and was working as a chef at a communications depot. Because this depot was so small and in a rural area, and because he was married, he was provided a house on the depot site to live in with his wife over the time. Because he was a chef and the depot was so small, he was the only chef that I was aware of, so it was essential that he be available on site to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinners. So living at the depot was pretty essential. I also recall his really odd behavior, which may not have anything to do with this case, but it was not uncommon to find him vacuuming his house or hanging washing out the back to dry at 1am. This may have something to do with him being a chef and working hours that were different than most. Just getting household chores done when he could. But he was also an extreme neat freak and I hated spending time there to keep his wife company because as a 16 year old, I did not appreciate being woken up to help vacuum or hang washing up so late at night. I mentioned all of this to a police officer years ago. All I can recall was that she was part of a task force at the time. She did ask me to get back to her, but I had a house fire and lost her contact details. Since then, I have never been able to locate them again since and I have no idea what her name was. I really don't remember, although I really wish I did. I truly believe that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this whole Mr. Cruel incident. It terrifies me to think that perhaps their dislike for me, or their passion to be sadistic towards myself, is possibly why they chose targets that were brunette and of the same age as myself. There is a saying in Australia which is, you don't shit where you eat, which means if you're going to commit a crime, you don't do it in your backyard. because is just too close to your home. So the thought of them lashing out at these young ladies instead of myself is just sickening. Of course, I have no definite proof on me or they slash he would most certainly be in prison as I type this. Obviously, I have nothing to do with them at all anymore. Whenever I was hurt, it was either psychological and sadistic, which is just impossible to prove to authorities unless there is a non-biased witness or I have any marks on my body, which again is pretty difficult to prove. My mother once told me when I was 14 that if I ever went to the police, she would lie. And then she asked me who I thought a judge would believe, her or a teenage girl. I was terrified to go to the authorities because I thought no one would believe me. And then the aftermath would be much, much worse for me. Since then, however, I have had my stepbrother charged and he did end up spending some time in jail for some of the crimes committed against me. Although most of them have gone unpunished. I don't hold any malice about that. And I'm impressed that the Victorian police were able to put together a case on what information they had, and that they were able to charge him at all. This does not alleviate my concerns about the Mr. Cruel cases though. There are so many coincidences that I find it frightening. 1. The intense interest in the media coverage of the cases. 2. All the victims being same age and same hair color as myself. 3. Living in the approximate area where he was committing the crimes. 4. Their facial hair being the same as the sample found at the crime scene. 5. Their colloquialisms that match Mr. Cruel's patterns of speech. 6. The time frames that Mr. Cruel was committing his crimes match the times that both of my family members were in Victoria. 7. Living in the northern suburbs. We lived close to the international airport and underneath the flight path of airplanes. 8. My stepfather's compulsion for tidiness and my stepbrother being in the army at the time of Mr. Cruel's active spree. 9. Mr. Cruel's activities seemed to cease when both my stepfather and stepbrother moved interstate from Victoria. 10. My stepfather's fascination with serial killers. 11. My family coming from Tasmania, as the police believed that Mr. Cruel was either Tasmanian or from New Zealand. This is an awful lot of coincidences concerning one case or one offender. I guess all of these coincidences don't really amount to a criminal case, but it has left me feeling ill, terrified, and with no one to talk to about this. I did try to mention it to my biological father once a few years years ago, but I think he just thought perhaps I was overreacting as he was not aware of how they hurt me as a child. I had never told him about any of this. Even when my stepbrother was charged and went to jail, my biological father had no idea why, and had no idea that my mother was aware, and that his father was also a part of it all. I can't shake the horrible feeling that I may have been raised by someone who had no problem in taking the life of a young girl. I know that either of them are capable of such actions, although if I was asked to choose which one, I thought it would most likely be the physical attributes match my stepbrother. But the calmness of Mr. Cruel is something that was more often displayed by my stepfather, so I don't really know. But I am very sure that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this case. I just don't know who to approach who will take all of this seriously. 
seriously. I also have a family of my own now, and I don't want them to hear about any of it. I have to be careful because I don't want to expose my children to these kinds of images slash thoughts. Lastly, I would just like to add, for those who question as to whether or not my thought processes about the situation are erm um, stable, I had to be psychologically assessed as part of the legal requirements when I had charges pressed against my stepbrother. The courts need to assure that the person making those kinds of allegations are mentally aware of their accusations, and that there is no sign of mental illness where they may have misinterpreted a situation. Yes, there are psychological effects. I suffer from PTSD, but honestly, if you knew the true horrors of the home I grew up in, then you would be amazed if anyone could endure such an upbringing and walk out of that home without any emotional baggage. If anyone who reads this knows of a person amongst the Victorian police task force who would be interested in talking with me, I have no problems with this, and would appreciate a way to contact them. As I type this, I'm sitting here shaking as I recall my old home and what those poor girls had to endure, and poor Carmen who probably did nothing wrong other than to view his face. My heart goes out to her family, but I am so scared that her family would bear a grudge towards me. Even though I have had nothing to do with the whole situation, and was the same age as their Carmen, grief can make someone view perspectives differently. I would be ashamed to face them unless I was able to assist in them getting some kind of justice. I have not mentioned any names, other than that of Carmen Chan who was one of his victims. I have not mentioned exact suburbs or exact information as if this is of interest to the police, I don't want to jeopardize any possible investigation and outcome by posting information publicly before an official investigation is done, nor do I want to cause any possible biased opinions as this could affect the outcome of a court hearing. I'm not saying that my step family members will ever be charged or go to court or that they are definitely guilty, but I will not take the risk of ruining any chances of possible justice just so I can tell my story on Reddit. Thanks for reading. Perhaps someone will respond with some kind of information or advice. In the original post that was created in the r slash unsolved murder subreddit, a user named Guguachu asked if OP's stepfather and stepbrother were alive and we got the following response from Corrupted. And keep in mind, this was created three years ago. Thank you for your concerns. Yes, they are both still alive. Neither of them have had access to my address or any other contact information for over a decade now. I don't have anything to do with them. I don't think my stepfather uses online forums such as Reddit because the last time I knew him, he wasn't really interested in technology, but who knows. Maybe in his older age, he has taken up new hobbies. Thanks for your concern though. This is also another reason as to why I don't or haven't mentioned names or places, etc. I am sure if either of them read this, they would know exactly who I am, and they would know that I am making references about them specifically, but I am okay with that. They would have to find me to do anything about it, and I have no intention of making that easy for them. Due to the fact that I had my stepbrother charged years ago about a different situation, I have cut contact with most of my family. Of course, most of them had nothing to do with the crime, but if they are not in contact with me, then they don't have my contact details. I am doing this for their protection. I have female cousins that I love like sisters, but I have had to walk away from my extended family and go into hiding years ago. I miss my extended family, but I love them enough to do this for not only my safety, but for theirs as well. There is actually an official document the Tasmanian courts have that expresses I cannot freely return to Tasmania and that I have had to break contact with the majority of my family due to my stepfather, mother, and stepbrothers behavior. So if they were ever stupid enough to try anything, they would be some of the first suspects to be considered. I do appreciate your reading my post and showing concern for me. Thank you. We also find out from OP that prior to making this post, they had little to no knowledge about Mr. Cruel. Corrupted said, Hi fellow Redditors, just wanted to make a quick note. I welcome anyone who questions timelines, etc. and is helping me by constructively pointing out any possible inconsistencies. I have been and am avoiding doing any research about the cold case because I don't want to subconsciously blend my childhood memories with new information that I learn online. Except for the composite sketch that I viewed and the mock-ups of a bedroom and bathroom, I have not read any information about this case at all. Everything I have mentioned is based on the memories of an 11 year old child from over 30 years ago, so there is most likely going to be some points that I may remember incorrectly or remember them from the point 
point of view of a child. Considering that I have refused to view any information about this cold case, the information I have supplied is all based on memories about what I recall from viewing on the media slash news from my childhood. I did originally mention how my stepfather would shush me and turn the television up, so I was exposed to the media at the time it was current. And also based on memories of what I recall was going on in my home environment at the time. I appreciate everyone who has read my post and thank everyone who has commented, replied, or questioned what information I have provided. So thank you again to all of you. The response here has been somewhat overwhelming but greatly appreciated. I do try to read and respond to every comment posted, but have become lost amongst them a few times. So I apologize if I miss anyone or take a bit longer to respond than what I normally would. I did not realize that I would get a response as large as what I have. I am truly grateful to everyone involved. The support has been amazing. Furthermore, it seems that when OP tried to share information with authorities, they refused to listen to them. A deleted user told OP to get in touch with police, and this is what OP had to say. Yeah, I tried a couple of times. Regular police stations are not interested because it's such an old case. They would refer me to a task force, and I don't know how to make contact with the original detective I spoke with. She seemed interested in what I had to say, but the most common belief that I have read is that they believe it may be someone from New Zealand. And sometimes, just sometimes, when they have a lead, they often overlook other options. Trying not to be critical because I believe that they do good work, but if their lead has not resulted in an outcome after so long, then perhaps they should look at other possibilities. I know that no one else would have accused my stepfather slash brother because my family appeared like a Stepford Wives scenario. To outsiders, we look like the perfectly adjusted family, and I doubt that it would have crossed anyone else's mind what I believe. In fact, when I had my stepbrother charged on different charges, even though he had many women accuse him in the past of similar attacks, no one had made any of the charges stick. And my mother managed to convince so many people that even though he was found guilty and went to jail, I had made it all up and that he was completely innocent. If people can believe that over an assault, then what are the chances I would be able to get many people to listen to the fact I believe they are linked to Mr. Cruel? I guess partially it's my own securities, but I would need to locate the contact details of the task force handling Mr. Cruel's case now, if it still exists. Then the same user told OP to reach out to Crime Stoppers, which OP had already done over two decades now. Apparently, they more or less transferred her to a different group where a woman took an interest in what OP had to say. Corrupted also said that they would try and call Crime Stoppers again, but either it fell through or they just never did it as I don't think we ever got an update with that particular route. So this entry isn't quite disturbing, well maybe it is depending on the person, but it's definitely more gross than anything else to me personally. I'm not trying to kink shame or anything, but this was definitely kind of funny. It was created just under a year ago in the r slash tifu subreddit, which if you don't know stands for today I f up. The user's name is no friend acquired. tifu by telling my gym bro about my c Plant. As always, this was not today, but a few weeks ago. So a while ago, me and my gym bro were in the middle of a workout and as always, we're talking about girls and stuff in between the sets. We somehow got to discussing ways to make Matt feel more like the real thing. I mentioned inside of one of my plants for the best experience since the pot is quite large and I could just kneel over it. Now, for some backstory, I'm no weirdo with a plant fetish. It all started when I was 13 and on a family vacation where I found what looked to me like a big magic acorn aka avocado seed. I took it home and planted it. Fast forward three years, I hit my puberty with which came the discovery of and as the pot was right next to my bed, I chose to finish into it for the aforementioned reasons. I did it only for about a year because even though the avocado grew a big healthy canopy like never before, some mushrooms started to grow in the pot which I found undesirable and didn't want my family to get suspicious. Well, when I told this to my gym bro, he didn't really understand what a reasonable procedure that was and labeled me as depraved. I guess I ended up being the weirdo after all. I still have the plant and it's almost almost 9 years old. Still use it time to time to remember its former glory. TLDR told my gym bro that I used to have <laughs> a dedicated plant to 
attachment to and now he thinks I'm a weirdo. And just a quick visit to OP's account, we can actually see this avocado plant. In a post made in 2022, OP took a picture of the plant, which was 8 years old at the time. He said, I discovered that my cat had been peeing in the pot while it was inside my room, so I brought it out and changed the soil. But it keeps getting worse. Should I just cut the whole top off? The, the roots are in very poor condition too. And when I first read this, I burst out laughing when I saw this comment in the thread. A user said, do the kind thing and put it out of its misery. Then user loaded butt mag said, he's been into the planter for years. That poor plant has been trying to die for a very long time. And in 2023, OP actually just cut the plant. Then in a now removed post that was created a day ago at the time of recording this video, OP asked for advice on helping his dear 10 year old avocado plant. I wish I could see the comments to this post, but I just can't seem to access them. But under essentially every single post of OP's, people are just making a bunch of jokes and I find it hilarious. This post was made in the r slash rbi subreddit three months ago by user Raising Jack. It's titled, My elderly mom is on hospice and her friend gives me a bad vibe. I cannot for the life of me figure out why I feel like this, but all of my spidey senses are tingling on this woman. Here's a bit of the background. I am 40 years old and female. My elderly mom, 70, has been ill for quite some time and is on hospice. She was living in an independent living space where it was all elderly people in apartment type units. She has been living there for about 6 or 7 months and made a few casual old people friends but mostly kept to herself or so I thought. A couple weeks ago, my boys and I were visiting my mom. We live right down the street and visit often. When a woman walks up to us with my mom, I extended my hand to introduce myself to this woman when she dismissed the handshake and instead went in for a hug and said, oh, I only do hugs for family and we're pretty much family. Okay, a little weird coming from someone I've never met before. And also never even heard a single mention of her, but I pretty much brushed it off thinking to myself that she's probably just really Really lonely or something. I asked my mom about this new friend and she just says that they met there at the old people place and she's been a really good friend to her. Great, I love when my mom has friends, it's important to have friends. But this woman just keeps giving me weird vibes and I can't pinpoint why. A few things that seem odd to me. My mom is moving to a more traditional apartment complex this weekend and this new friend liked the new apartment complex so much that she decided to move to the same place as well. Her apartment isn't ready yet, but she'll be moving to the same complex as my mom next month. She apparently bought my mom's dog a I have the world's best auntie sweatshirt for Christmas. They had known each other for maybe two months at that point. She called the other day too, I don't really know why, I guess it was to give me her phone number and more formally introduce herself to me. She talked about doing a lot of caretaking stuff for my mom. She said something like, oh, I can manage her medications for her if you want. So I replied that while I appreciate the offer, there's a lot of controlled medications and hospice prefers to keep minimal people involved in the medicine stuff, and that taking on caretaking responsibilities for a friend can get exhausting, so it might be best for them to just focus on being friends rather than her wearing herself out trying to take care of her. She immediately went to my mom and made it sound like I was shit talking my own mom saying how she's just an exhausting person, blah blah. When I confronted this new friend about going to my mom and relaying our private conversation in a totally twisted way, the friend lied and said that my mom had grabbed her phone and read it all into text messages. It was over the phone and not at all via text messages. When I pointed out there were no texts, she just kind of stumbled and I dropped it because I knew it wouldn't get anywhere. Every time I talk to my mom on the phone, I can hear this woman telling her what to say or adding comments in. And none of it is outwardly worrisome things, but it feels like I can't have any conversation with just my mom. I'm a very trusting person who generally tries to see the best in people, and this woman has not given me any concrete reasons to doubt her intentions and has in fact been very friendly and polite to me in all of our interactions. Nonetheless, I can't shake this feeling that there's something wrong here. I sat my mom down yesterday and had a conversation with her about my feelings towards this new friend and she didn't get defensive at all but disagreed with me and said that her new friend is just being kind in offering to help with stuff because she knows that my mom is not the most organized of people and could use the help. 
I begged my mom to please be cautious and to take the friendship slow, and to keep it simply as a friendship and let me, her actual family, handle caretaking stuff. Despite no changes in medications, my mom has been more confused lately and comes across to me like she's overtaken medication, but I only give her one dose at a time and the rest is locked up at all times so it isn't that. But just to be safe, since she's more confused lately, I took my mom's credit and debit cards so no one can take advantage of her financially. Reddit, please help me figure out what this woman would have to gain in coming between my mom and I if it isn't medication or money. I don't know how to do a background search or if that's legal for any random person to do, but I did look this new friend up on a couple websites and all I learned from that is that she has a lot of also known as names, but I can't find anything else. I'll pay for a background search if anyone has a recommendation for good ones. We're in California. Does any of this raise red flags to anyone else or am I just being too overprotective of my mom on this? Oh, I almost forgot. I called one of my mom's oldest and closest friends the other day and asked her if she's met this new friend and if so, what was her impression? She said, Honestly, I don't know why I feel like this, but I just get a bad feeling about her. I just feel like she's up to no good. Hearing this made me feel better in that I'm not the only one to pick up on something, but I don't know what, if anything, to do about it all. And most of you are probably thinking the same thing as user wrestles with pastry. This user made the following comment under the post. This podcast covers this exact same scenario. A woman would befriend elderly people, offer to help, gain access to these folks' resources and property, mess with their meds, then the senior citizen would eventually disappear. What you described reminded me of this immediately. Trust your gut. I wish you all safety and luck. ETA, the podcast is called The Opportunist and the episode is called Kimberly Smith. There are five parts. Another user named Starkville said, oh, f no. This lady is up to something, probably money. Please make sure your mother hasn't signed anything giving this woman power of attorney. I'd probably hire a former law enforcement private investigator and check her out. Sometimes they can relay a warning too. I am tempted to tell you to make a huge stink and make a lot of noise at her to leave your mother alone. If she knows you're onto her and you're going to be combative, she might back off and find someone else to glom onto. This next post was made nearly a decade ago in the r slash let's not meet subreddit by user cats for peace. It's titled, an obsessed man has been stalking me since the age of three. And I'm sure someone is going to mention it, but the names given are just made up by OP. They are not real names. A little backstory before I get to the goods. When I turned 21, an older man approached me in a bar in a very small town that I was living in on the west coast. The town, although small, was very bubbly and had a great community of people. I chatted with the man who seemed very enthusiastic about meeting me and said things like, I've finally found you, which was really no different than a lot of things men would often say when trying to flirt at a bar. I would later come to find out that what he meant was he had finally found me thanks to the check-in feature on Facebook after trying to track my movements somewhat successfully since I had turned 18. I would also come to find out in subsequent messages that this man had been obsessed with me after first meeting me at the age of three. Since starting college, I had moved seven times for various reasons to different locations and towns surrounding my university, making my exact location hard to pinpoint for any length of time until I finally settled in this small town. Although this man had seemed very eager, I did not think much of it. Since I had just turned 21, I began to frequent bars as a new pastime on the weekends. I soon realized that I would run into this man every single weekend, but then again, I saw all the other regulars every weekend as well, and did not find it odd until I received my first letter. I am now 24 years old and have moved to the other side of the country. However, the messages have not stopped. I would like to share all of the letters and messages starting here with the first letter dated October 5th, 2012. Hi Clara, this is Gordon. We met at Bellflower's Tavern. I'm very shy, like a deer in the headlights when I see you. I hope this is not too forward, but the written word is the best way for me to communicate and I usually go up to see music, and not sure when I'll see you next. I looked up Clara, Puget Island, and knew to look for the diner for a description. So here I go. Dear Clara, I'm so taken by you that I can't eat, sleep, I'm just crazy in the head for you. 
I know I may be older, but what is age but a number? I lost my 30s taking care of my grandmother 24-7, 365 for the last 10 years, and the last time I met someone that made me feel like you do was 14 years ago. It lasted 2 years, and I know what it feels like to be cheated on. I think you are the mostest, sweetestest, beautiful girl I have ever met in forever, and would absolutely love to know you better and for some unexplained reason, I remember everything about you. Your eyes, hair, what you wore, what you said, since I met you for the first time. You asked me 20 questions and the way you looked at me, I got this burning feeling inside. And then, when you said you wanted to go play your violin for another 3 hours and the fact you love jazz so much, well, those are turn on words. Music is life. Love and everything I like to speak through music, so if I were to put on a song for you, it would be Why Can't I Be You by The Cure. Then, Going Out of My Head and Night and Day, Sergio Mendez and Brazil 66. There is too much to say in a short letter, I could go on forever. The first night we met, 22nd of September. You gave me a hug and said that I felt good to hug. The world stopped. You said on Saturday the 29th that I looked real good and I nearly melted and was speechless. So much to say so if I'm on the wrong track please let me know and I will back off and we can be friends. Also, you can ask the university or the board of directors for a Richard Morris. He has known me since I was born and was my mom's first husband and was a professor in anthropology at UW so you can check me out. Sincerely, Gordon Clark. P.S. Clara, I do not know you well enough to know and I don't judge but you are very classy and have poise and if you are the reserved kind of girl, well that is not a problem. Make me a reservation. I'm very loyal, sweet, gentle, loving and kind and unlike your last boyfriend, the blithering idiot, I don't stray or cheat. The next day, OP shared a follow up. Some quick updates. I received the messages he sent to my mom regarding me and it's a gold mine. He reveals that he has been attempting to contact the FBI because he believes I'm in danger. My mom sent the messages in screenshots so it will take me a while to type them all out. Here I will be posting the next set of messages that I received from him. If you missed the first part, here it is. To provide some clarification beforehand, this set of messages will include some information where he says he met me when I was 15. In later messages, he clarifies that this was when we met again, sort of like our newfound opportunity at being together after he first became obsessed with me when I was 3. From what I can gather, he must have been tracking my mother's movements when I was a child in order to have encounters with me until he lost track of me for a while when I moved out of my parents house and changed my name on Facebook. I believe that when he refers to meeting me again, he is talking about the next time he was able to locate me after I changed living situations. Neither my mother Mother nor I know how this happened. She is horrified. Enjoy. P.S. The third message in this installment states that he is so heartbroken that he will have to let me go. Don't fret. It only took him exactly 24 hours and 2 minutes before he couldn't resist contacting me again. Hi Clara, I have no idea if you read my letter to you or not, but if you did and tried texting me with a response, I don't have a cell, it's a home phone. Also, if you did read it and it made you uncomfortable, I apologize. Remember Torn Reality and then again 6 years later at Belfast? Flowers Tavern, please read. Dear Clara, I had to unfriend you because of feelings that had developed after talking with you about all sorts of stuff and getting to you and your interest at Bellflowers Tavern. With my grandmother Laura's aunt, I totally was taken by you and hoped you were right about us meeting again someday. And wouldn't you know it, six years later we did at Bellflowers Tavern, where yes, once again, I feel very hard for you. And then put together that you changed your name on Facebook to Clara B, that it triggered my memory and realized you are the same girl and thought that if you came back to work at the diner that I might have the chance to go with you. You said two years is not that long and so, like an idiot, I've held on to the chance to be with you for two years. Yeah, crazy. But when we talked, the rest of the world went quiet, and when you said all those nice things to me and said I felt good to hug, you made me feel like the only person in the room. I sent many messages before and, well, never got an answer. So after hoping for so long and realizing you might not come back and it looks like you have a boyfriend now, I just feel as though I have to let this crazy idea in my heart go. So please don't be mad, but this is just the way I need to handle my emotions and let you go. 
This was an extremely hard decision to make for me, but now I have no idea if you were interested in me or not. So I'm feeling 100% heartbroken about this. I hope you can understand. Who knows what the future holds? You're the one who can see the thing in the future. OP would make a third and final update regarding their stalker on the 27th of April in the same year. In this next set of messages, we find out the truth about how my stalker first became infatuated with me at the age of three. I pick up where I left off in part two, where this man couldn't resist contacting me again, sending his next message exactly 24 hours and two minutes after telling me he was letting me go. Did I mention he believes I'm clairvoyant? Clara, here is a picture of my grandmother. Do you know who the other lady is? I'm really trying here. I know you know. You promise so, why no reply? I like a fool. I'll still wait for you. Hope you are true. Clara, your premonition came half true. We did meet again, and I did fall for you completely again, unaware. The second time before you left, you said it's true to believe you and that you would come back to your workplace, I think you said between May to August of 15. You said, wait for you. I have completely been loyal to this notion even though you have not replied. I have not dated or hooked up with anyone. I feel heartbroken now and at a loss. Do I just try and forget about us being together and move on? Let me know. Or do I just wait to be crushed? You need to say something even if you don't want to be with me. It's not fair to leave me hanging like this for so long. Gordon. 1994 Seattle, I was hanging with your older brother at the mall. He was babysitting you. He and I met because the bus driver left me for 8 hours, stranded to wait for the next bus. Your brother was skateboarding down by the depot and said he could help find a cool place to hang out and the buses were free, but first he had to pick up his little sister Clara at his mom's and stepdad's house and then we could go to the mall and hang out. He said his sister might have mental problems because she is convinced she can see people's future, but you were only three and he said to go along with whatever fantasy you had. That day, your fantasy was that when you got older, we would meet again and get married, that I was going to be your husband and you were telling everybody at the mall and your brother had to tell people we were going along with your fantasy. Remember that? I have a perfect memory. Ask your brother. This is a true story. Then again, you were convinced at Uncle Tom's, then at Bellflower's Tavern. We are connected somehow by some crazy force, Clara. And I really am not crazy. You know this to be true. You have to know. Well, I guess I'll wait. Sincerely, Gordon. So something that we started to do in the previous part of this series is include a more wholesome entry at the very end as a sort of palate cleanser. This entry will not be officially included in the iceberg. This one was created by Consistent Reason 349 in the r slash true off my chest subreddits created this account just for this story. Also, I want to keep in mind that I'm sharing this story from my perspective and from what my brother told me, so I don't know if anything is completely accurate, but I also don't have a reason to doubt the accuracy. Me and my siblings grew up in a highly abusive environment. Besides my older brother, I have two younger siblings, a younger brother and a younger sister. Our parents were addicted to alcohol. They would drink every day and it was like a forced round of Russian roulette every single day. We either had luck and they would just argue downstairs with each other or they would come upstairs to release their anger onto us. And when they did, my older brother would stand guard at the stairs to make sure we were safe. He would try to make them focus on him, so whenever they came upstairs, they would horribly beat him, and when they tried to enter any of our rooms, he would provoke them so they would focus on him until they were too tired to focus on us. While he protected us from them, he sacrificed his own childhood, and instead of doing something he liked, he educated himself and learned how to do programming each and every single day. He knew that something from the IT and programming sector would get him a high paying job and his goal was to get out of there and take us with him but to take care of us he needed money. He also never had friends at school because he saw friends as a waste of time for his goals, let alone the fact that he never properly finished his education because he was more worried about us than his own future. When he was 18, he did an internship for a local IT office that was looking for employees and after a few weeks he got the job and he was making good money. 
After he moved out, he found an apartment with enough space for all of us. And from then on, he tried everything to get us out of there. A bit later, my parents got arrested because my younger sister came to school with bruises from the beating she took from our mom before. After my brother was gone, we were targeted, but at least we didn't have to wait for long. After my parents got arrested, we started to live with my brother. He had to do a bit more stuff so that my younger siblings could live with us too, but he somehow managed to convince authorities to let them stay with us. I will never understand where he took all his energy from to do all this. I was still underage when we continued to live with him, but in his new job, he made enough money to make sure we had it good, and he finally gave us the loving and caring home we craved for such a long time. I adore him so much. He was so selfless all the time and rather took care of us than of himself. And yesterday, something happened that made me want to share this story. When I woke up, I went to get some breakfast and when I passed my brother's door, I heard him crying in his room. I knocked at his door and went inside and the moment he saw me, he wiped away his tears and smiled. He asked if I was fine. I didn't feel the need to answer. I just hugged him. I felt so sorry for him. He sacrificed everything so that we were safe. He couldn't hold in his tears any longer and I told him that he should probably go to therapy because what he went through would be way too much to handle for everyone. I adore him so much and I will forever be grateful for every sacrifice he did for us. He did not deserve any of the things our parents put him through. We as a whole never deserved what our parents put us through. They were supposed to be a safe space for all of us. I will help my brother and I will make sure he feels loved too. He deserves to have a safe space too. He wants to be ours, so I want to be his. Thank you for reading.